Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 110. Today our guest is Dave Stewart. Good afternoon, Dave. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, sure. I can hear you. Are you getting me? Yeah, I do hear you. Yeah. Hold yeah, on. cool. Thanks for being on the show today. I thought we'd get started by talking a bit about how you came to play the keyboards and if there were any other instruments that you played prior to that. I always, uh, always fancied keyboard uh you know i did i did play guitar for a few years but i was i you know i was struggling with it really and keyboard was such a logical instrument i was fascinated by the piano like my mum used to take me around to my auntie's house a few streets away and she had an old upright piano and i used to sit in there i was about i don't know five or six just plonking about on it um really really wanted one and in the end we acquired that piano we um pushed it through the street <laughs> into, into my mum's house so that i can have um you know some practice and i had piano lessons and uh, i never looked back um but yeah it's my first instrument and it will be my last i'm sure so would you say that you were just inspired by the instrument itself first long before you saw anybody in particular play it where you're like oh i really want to be like that I just love the idea that you could go, you could toddle up to the thing and you could press a key and a nice sound came out. And the sound went on as long as you held the note down. And eventually it died out and then you could play another note. And th this thing of it being, um, you know, low notes on the left, high notes on the right, appealed to my, my simple mind. Um, it was like very logical and uh, I, yeah, I just loved it. It was a wonderful invention. Um, and so I started having piano lessons, but it, it was all very classical and kind of by the book. And it reached a point where um, I came in and I'd worked out some like simple triads. It was like F, F sharp and G. I said to the teacher, what, what's this? You know, that I'm, I played them to her and she said, uh, oh, no, 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 dear, we can't talk about that. You, you need to tell your mother that we, you to have the jazz lessons and then we can talk about F sharp and so forth. And that'll be another 30 shillings a week. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that was the end. Of, that was the end of the piano lessons, sadly. Well, it's interesting they offered jazz so early because I think a lot of a lot of teachers probably wouldn't never even breach the topic they just kind of stay in the classical idiom and, and leave it there you know i think probably anything that wasn't straight classical uh, you know kind of well-known european symphonic music by dead composers would have counted as jazz um it was just the, she she had a rigid way of doing it and if you if you stepped outside <laughs> it was called jazz but um, i dread to think the kind of jazz she might have taught me actually because <laughs> um, you know the, um, they've been working with um, a young guitar player, Baron Matthews, who um, is currently in your neck of the woods. He's going to be playing in Atlanta on Sunday with the Pineapple Thief. You know that band? I am aware of them. You know, Gavin's playing yeah. with them. And... Gavin's in the band. Yeah. Uh, our, our guitarist, Baron, has joined their band uh, a few months ago as a kind of stage guitarist. And we've been working together for about five years, six years, and I'm trying to um, teach him some of the finer points of harmony and stuff. And when he was studying music at um, college, there was a, an assumption on his part that he should go on and study jazz at university. And his tutor very wisely warned him against this. And I do not do that because you'll be taught a standard kind of jazz approach with flat seventh chords and you'll be learning jazz standards. But it will just be another very formal education. But what you really need to do is to understand harmony outside of any stylistic limitation and he took that advice and i'm very glad he did because i can now indoctrinate him <laughs> with my chords that are not standard jazz chords but they do require a, a certain knowledge of harmony and scales you have to know what you're doing to to play our music well absolutely i can't think of a better teacher so that, that's, oh, that's yeah thank you thank I've you i've seen some great footage i believe you all played some live dates back i don't know three or four years ago now is that right yeah, yeah. Four years ago, we played in London. Um, Gavin joined us on drums. Uh, Baron, it was Baron's first gig. Um, it was a great gig. I mean, you know, I don't know if I played particularly well that night, but the audience was terrific. They came from all corners of the globe to see our little band. Uh, people came from 17 countries and Americans. Uh, Australians from all over Europe and um, it, it just created such a great vibe it was it was brilliant uh, we had a great time and um, 
we it's a bit difficult to keep working with Gav at the moment because he's so busy, you know, he's just totally booked up. Um, so mostly we work live as a trio, just myself, Barbara and Baron on guitar. That, and that's great. You so can, you, and, is, there, is there a chance there'll be some more live events happening? Yeah, we've got um, a really important date coming up in London on July the 9th. Um, the idea of this gig was that in 2020, Barb and I realized we've been working together for 40 years and we thought it would be nice to hire a really cool central London concert hall with a great sound system, comfortable seating, and kind of pushed the boat out for an anniversary gig, you know, 40 years of Dave and Bob. Um, started selling tickets, it was all going great, and then You Know What came along, and we were all hiding under the bed, trying not to get infected, and seeking jabs, which weren't immediately available. Um, my little brother, Andrew, caught COVID early on, and wasn't uh, vaccinated. Couldn't get into the local hospital, which was the hospital where I was born in Waterloo, London. And at round about the same time, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, got it, was swiftly ushered into a private ward where he was treated naturally. Um, my brother was turned away and had to go home and sweat it out. And he, he told me it was like terrible, the worst, worst illness he's ever felt in his life. So after he told me that, I thought, I do not want to catch this fucking thing. It's, it doesn't sound too clever to me. So Barb and I have been <laughs> sort of very cautious, getting our food delivered and uh, avoiding people, you know, being kind of like hermits. But we're, we're going to come out of our, uh, our caves now. And this gig on July the 9th, King's Place, Hall 1, London, um, was postponed twice due to COVID, but it's back on now. Ticket sales have resumed and we're really looking forward. Excellent. Well, I will spread the word about that for sure. Because Thank you. It sounds Great. like quite the event. And yeah, yeah. We've got some, we do have some pals coming over from Chicago and everybody's welcome. I think the UK is open for visitors now. You don't have to uh, sort of show any medical history or anything. You can just breeze in. So the hall itself is actually from a, a, a sort of sanitation point of view, probably one of the safest venues in, in England. They, um, they stayed voluntarily shut when, um, after lockdown was, was relaxed here, most venues just said, okay, you know, business as usual, come in and crowded everybody in. But this venue said, no, we're going to stay shut for a few weeks because we think we need to see how things are going. And while they were locked down and, and had the door shut, they installed a whole air replacement system so that, um, you know, you're not breathing the air that the, the last guys in the concert hall breathe it's all flushed out they sanitize the whole thing between shows so you know it's it's a nice clean up-to-date venue and um yeah you know i'm i'm not worried about going in there i think i think we'll be fine no i think you'll be fine yeah well yeah. that sounds great and i wish more places would uh refurbish uh the uh ventilation in that manner i think you know that's just yeah. a good thing to do anyway even when well yeah quite a yeah time like this you know yeah yeah Yes, air should really only be breathed once, ideally, I think. Yeah, yeah the fresher, the better, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell me a bit about the projects you're currently working on. I imagine you're getting ready for this gig. Um, what else is happening? Well, there's, there's an overlap with getting a new album ready for release. Um, it's a bit tense, you know, trying to do both at once. But we, um, we played in Japan in 2019 as a trio and we introduced four no five new songs that no one had heard before which are going to be on the new album and we have subsequently been working on four others so we've got a lot of the, all the guitars recorded um the guide vocals are down i've done a lot of the basic keyboard parts and the material is there so we've got a good set of nine songs but there's an awful lot of work to do before it's going to be released so that project is um you know, working on it all the time. Same time pr preparing for the gig, which is not quite so sweaty. Um, we have got um, some tunes that we've played live before, but we're going to do some new ones that have not um, not yet been played and well, certainly not played in the UK anyway. Um, at the same time, we're working on promotion for the gig. Barb's doing a kind of edit to a little video we're putting together. We, The three of us had a kind of... Uh, a sort of zoom type chat about our Stuart Gaskin music and 
the first episode of that, we talk about early tracks and how we got started and how we met Baron, that, that kind of thing. So we, we'll be putting that online next week on our YouTube channel. So really, we're just, you know, working around the clock on our own music. That's excellent. So this will be the proper follow-up to Star Clocks, correct? Yeah, exactly. And it will be following a similar format. It will be out on Burning Shed, who we've got a very happy relationship with. A great, great company. Yeah. Great label, yeah. I, I don't know if you know much about Burning Shed, but I can tell you that, you know, I've, like, I've been in the business 54 years, which is a bit frightening to admit. Um, and in that 54 years, I've met, quite a lot of record company people and I've met maybe six record company people that I really liked and even if some of them early on were, were paying me a terrible exploitative royalty I still didn't mind because I like them <laughs> um, now with Burning Shed I like them but also they pay very fair split to their bands so if you're manufacturing your own um, CDs or you you own your own catalog your downloads whatever you're selling they will sell it for you at a very fair commission and basically the artist earns way more than than they do as distributor they take a modest percentage and there was a time when one of them called me and said um you know what he said we just realized we're we're not paying you enough i said all oh, right he said yeah there are some bands that burning shed distribute that we pay more and we think you should get that rate <laughs> so i said okay fine you know so that's never happened before in 54 years and you know they're just scrupulously honest and being a small company i can speak to them if we need to discuss something it's not like this corporate thing of people not being at their desk for weeks on end so yeah it's it's a great it's a great thing they've they've um helped myself and barbara keep our music in circulation for the last like 10 years or so yeah great great label um yeah um, purchased a number of great records from them over the years and mm. look forward to more yeah absolutely they're, they're yeah one of the, one of the good guys at the, yeah. on a very short list <laughs> yeah yeah you know um, so could you share a few titles of some of those new songs with us, just out of curiosity? I could. I'm, I'm loath to talk about it too much because we want okay. it to be a surprise. Let me just lay one on me. Okay. Uh, let me think which one should I tell you about. Yeah, I'll tell you about one. It's, it's called Fire in the Kingdom. And the inspiration for that was the great blaze of London in 1666. Okay. We've had two big events in the UK in, in, in years ending in 66. Um, the most recent one was winning the World Cup in 1966. Oh, yeah. But um, 300 years before that, it was a rather unfortunate event that, that uh, took place in the city of London where um, fire engulfed the city and 98 churches were burnt to the ground. The whole thing went on for a week because it wouldn't rain and the wind was blowing the, the flames from the east of London over to the west. And it finally stopped just short of the Palace of Westminster, which is where our parliament now meets. Mm -hmm, right. Uh, you know, it kind of came, people were getting in barges and trying to run away on the river. So the, that's kind of, being a Londoner, that was um, quite an important um, part of my kind of, you know, DNA history, living in the place. And um, I got inspired to write a song about it. I did a lot of research, actually, and I found all these old manuscripts of people talking about it. And... Um, some of the accounts were like, you know, kind of hair raising, finding um, bodies just burnt to a cinder. And at St. Paul's Cathedral, the uh, the bells in the tower were actually melted in the heat and you had molten metal falling out of the mortar. Um, yeah, it was just insane. So we wrote a, che a cheerful little ditty about that. Yeah, I hope they didn't lose any hunchbacks in the uh, melting. <laughs> <laughs> no. Different theater or, ca or cathedral, but close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I was wondering if you could kind of fill our, our listeners in on how you how you met Barb and how you came to become a duo. You know, I know yeah. you, she was originally one of the Northettes with Hatfield and North. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, uh, so fill us in. Tell me a little more. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, we first met in December 1969. Um, I was a few days short of my uh 18th no i was a few days short of my 19th birthday and she was uh, she was just turned 19 and she and steve hillage came around and paid me a visit i was living at my parents house in waterloo central london mm -hmm. they'd come down from um kent university in canterbury where they were both students and they'd met there and got together and the two of them 
it paid me an impromptu visit. I, I don't know if I knew they were coming because we didn't have um, email or, uh, you know, we may have had a telephone, but um, it was expensive to make a call. So they just showed up on the doorstep. There they were. And um, there was Steve, my old school pal, with this beautiful dark-haired girl who I was slightly in awe of. And the two of them came in and we chatted and had a coffee. And Bob remembers I played my hammered organ, which was um, set up in my brother's bedroom. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of room for my poor little brothers, but, you know, we all squeezed in somehow. And uh, that was the first time Bob and I met. And then, obviously, I was, I was constantly in touch with Steve because he was, like, you know, a close friend from... Uh, since we were like 14 or 15 um and he managed to get an audition for decca records and had to make a demo tape and i heard his demo tape and the band egg that i was in at the time actually played the backing on some of these tunes i think we did two songs perhaps but barbara sang backing vocals on one of them and i heard her voice and i thought wow that's a really nice low alto voice really really pleasant sound um and so I thought she would be a good person to involve in future projects, didn't quite know what. But then my friend Chris Cutler from the band Henry Cow suggested that we did some um, big kind of musical collective type gigs under the name of the Ottawa Company. And the idea of that was you, you came in and the, all the band names and divisions between the musicians were dissolved for an evening. So the members of Egg would join forces with the members of Henry Cow and some other friends who are musicians, and we'd sort of mingle freely in a promiscuous kind of way and do, you know, certain interesting tunes, and that was the evening's entertainment. So on one of those gigs, I invited Barb to come along and sing a Robert Wyatt song. I think it was Moon in June. Um, we sort of made Barb a tape of it. She learned it. We did it, you know, as a small audience. The Ottawa Company didn't last very long, but, I, you know, that was the first thing where Barb got up and actually sung a song. And then not long after that, she joined Spira Gyro, which was a psychedelic folk band based out of the Kent University, and embarked on quite an extensive tour of Europe. She and the other band members took a year out of their college course so that they could actually go off and be a pro band. And they were one of the first groups to, to tour Holland at the time in the early 70s and got a record deal. So she was going along a parallel career to mine. She was there with Spyro Gyra. They, they were putting out an album. And sometime prior to that, Egg had put out their first album. So we were, you know, we were friends and we just stayed friendly for years and years and years and years. And then there came a time when I kind of had enough playing in bands. I wanted to do something different. I started getting weird impulses to do pop arrangements. Because when I started playing in bands, I was in a, a local covers band called The Southsiders. And we used to play all these nice old Tamula, Tamula Motown tunes and um, pop hits of the day, some of which were, were quite nice, nice songs. And I just fancied doing a bit of that and, you know, kind of letting drop the kind of all the sort of jazz rock stuff I'd been doing with Bruford and the kind of complex instrumental stuff I'd written for Hatfield and the North National Health. This was all great stuff, but I needed a break from it and I started doing some pop instead. And um, I made a record, um, did a version of What Becomes of the Broken Hearted, the famous old Tamla song. I invited Colin Bluntstone of the Zombies to sing on it. And that, that was Barb's idea she, because she and her sister grew up in, actually in, in Hatfield in Hertfordshire. And Colin was a local boy who um, they knew since he was, you know, probably a teenager. And when I was looking for a vocalist for Broken Hearted Bob, said, you should try Colin. He's got the right voice for it. And that was, that was a really good suggestion. So Colin and I did this one-off track. And amazingly, it was a hit record. It got into the top 20 in the UK, got number 13. We were on top of the pops, you know, and this was all like last thing I thought of when I recorded it. But it all happened out the blue, and I thought, yeah, well, this is this okay. Um, it's a bit embarrassing going on top of the pops. Not really my thing, but they, there we have it. When I was recording Broken Hearted, I had some free studio time donated to me in which I could do what I wanted. And I recorded that track, but 
roughly at the same time, I also recorded a backing track for It's My Party, which um, a friend has suggested as a, as a kind of daft off the wall idea. Uh, she said, why, why don't you do a version of that It's My Party song? I thought, yeah, 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 that's crazy, crazy idea. It's really, really funny. And I thought it'd be really great if Barb sung it, you know, because it, it needs a female vocalist because it's about being jilted by your boyfriend at a party. Mm -hmm. So I rang Barb and I said, do you fancy doing that? And um, she was slightly embarrassed by the, the, um, the, na the nature of the song. Um, but um, because it was me doing it and she, she had some kind of regard for my, <laughs> you know, my musicality, she said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And she came over to the studio like one thirty in the morning or something in a, in a cab and, and just did the vocal there and then double tracked it and disappeared. And after broken hearted was a hit, I thought, um, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything else to do with Colin. We didn't really have, uh, close enough musical tastes. You know, we, we had a different priorities musically. I thought I should do something with it. It's my party. So we went into another studio and I paid, to um, do a few more overdubs. Bob did some BVs on it. Um, I added a few sound effects and we, I mixed it. And we took it to Stiff Records and they saw its potential immediately and said, yep, yeah, this is really good, we're gonna release it. And then again, to our utter astonishment, it got to number one in the UK charts. After a few weeks, it just leapt up the charts. Stiff did a great job getting it in the shops. And there we were again on top of the pops and I thought, Christ, what's going on here? You know, this is not what I was thinking about when I was in national health, but right. <laughs> it was a new, a whole new direction. And the fame and fortune bit didn't appeal to me at all. I didn't like being stopped in the street by people who said, oh, I saw you on the television last night. And it's like, yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> good, good for you, mate. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like people treat you oddly and sometimes a bit rudely if, if they think you're famous. The money was handy um, because it meant I could take time out. I didn't have to do boring day jobs to keep um, to keep afloat. For a few years, I could pay the rent and uh, have complete and utter artistic freedom to do what I wanted. And clearly, the musical relationship with Barb was something that people liked hearing, and I thought it worked really well. The sound of my keyboards and her voice. I thought, yeah, this is this is we can make something special out of that. But I couldn't immediately come up with a way of doing it. I didn't have like 20 other songs that we wanted to record. So we um, obviously spent quite a long time recording It's My Party. And while we were doing that, we would sit on airplanes and think about other songs we could do and started coming out with the, the weirdest suggestions, one of which was Siamese Cat Song, um, which was a song from um, a cartoon. Um, you know, it was very, very much not what I was known for. Was that that <laughs> we are Siamese, if you please, from yeah from Disney movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, did the, we, we did it. Our version of that was was pretty nice. I thought, you know, it was kind of musically exploratory. You know, I, I kind of changed the um, the backing around a lot, and um, it was kind of nice. And uh, I was just really enjoying it. It felt fresh and playful, and uh, it had humour in there. <clears throat> not all the bands I was in really wanted a lot of humor, but um, it's always been there in my music. In, you know, sometimes you have to dig deep to find it, but there's usually some, something quirky going on, if not outrageously, stupidly funny. Oh, so, true. Um, and it's not always about lyrics either. Sometimes it's some of your harmonic choices and yeah. such. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, you can, you, know, <clears throat> you can have an ironic chord change if you know what you're listening for. Um, but I think the key to it really for, for me, just as an arranger and, um, and also as a songwriter now is to try to not do the obvious thing, not, not just to stick to the same old chords. I try not to repeat myself too much. I'm most happy as a writer when I can come up with something that I think, oh, you know, I don't think I've done that before. Like it might just be something simple, like suspending the, a high ninth interval of a chord and it becoming the major seventh interval of the next chord, which means that the chord movement itself is actually a little bit unexpected, not something I would normally do. So I, I sort of set little puzzles like that for myself and then I solve them. And sometimes the results strike me as being, at least in my own terms, quite original, although other people might think it's all just, it's all been done, I don't know. But um, that's, you know, I, I think it's important to progress as a, a player and as a musician. I've been trying to do that all my life. Um, I do see people 
sadly, starting off really, really good players uh, at the age of like 22, 23. And then all too often they hit a glass ceiling. They get quite good at what they're doing. They get a few good gigs. They start getting recognition as a good player. And they just coast on that. And they, they don't bother putting in the hours that they used to put in uh, when they were learning the instrument. Um, I mean, Baron's dad told me that he was absolutely obsessive as a 14 year old when he first played electric guitar. So I'm thinking, right, well, listen, Baron, stay obsessive, mate, because if you want to be like a, one of the real guys, like an Alan Holdsworth, it's a lifetime job. You don't sure. just, you know, you don't just sit in front of YouTube and go, oh yeah, cool lick. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's go down the pub. You know, um, you, Alan had, um, apparently Bill Bruford told me Alan had a big pile of, um, paper. Um, the size of like four thick telephone directories, which were notes on the material in, um, what's it called? Slanimsky's um, Thesaurus of Music and Scales, which Alan studied very deeply, worked out scales he liked, melodic shapes that he liked, because he's playing, when you, when you slowed it down to the point where you could understand what he was doing, had incredible melodies in it. Um, you know, little twists and turns where you'd, you'd, the melody will be going up, it's going, it will suddenly jump down an octave and go down or stuff like that. And it was a lifetime study of music that you, you could see had really informed his, um, his writing, his chord sequences, his harmony and his playing. Just incredible musician, sadly missed. But I do oh, want sure. younger, you know, like I want these younger musicians like Baron is now in his 30s. I really, really want him to kind of get on it and, and progress in the same way. Well, I think that's a great idea. You know, I, I totally know what you mean about the glass ceiling. And I think a lot of notable um, players kind of get there. You know, I think you get distracted by other things, fame, mm, and, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah. you kind of lose the essence of what inspired you when you were young. So yeah, it's yeah. great to stay in touch with that if you can and keep yeah. building yeah. upon it. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't, <clears throat> with myself, I don't have to force myself to try to, to study because for me like musical invention is a kind of study as i explained earlier and so therefore it's just something i naturally do and naturally enjoy but yeah um i always try to enthuse about that process to other musicians they don't always get it you know it's like hey, what's, what's he talking about you know and i guess there is a danger that if you become a very far out advanced guitar player like alan holdsworth people will say oh, oh, all all those guys all the solos that guy does, they all sound the same. I can't hear what he's doing because he plays so quickly, you know. I mean, when I worked with him, um, he would play some dazzling run. And as, as an illustration to the scale he would use over a certain chord, and I say, I said to him once, Alan, could you just play that again slowly? I said, I can't quite hear it. And he was like, oh, man, yes, you, you can hear it, man. I said, no, I honestly can't. Please, please slow, play it at a quarter speed. <laughs> <laughs> then I can, I can hear what you're doing. I'll write the notes down, and I'll go off and figure it out. But, yeah, he, he, was, he had a, a mind like a hummingbird, you know. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, so many people are befuddled by his sense of harmony because it's yeah. almost otherworldly. Oh, it's insane. Did you have a similar feeling when you first encountered him um or were you like okay i, I kind of i kind of know where this guy's coming from i knew him as a, a virtuosic soloist um with bands like soft machine and um some you know other other bits and pieces he'd done more or less as a session or as a guest player or as a, a temporary thing he was known as somebody who didn't stick with projects very long um, when Bill invited him to join the Bruford band, I, I took him aside and said, Alan, look, you know, you don't usually stick with bands very long. Um, if you don't want to stick with this one very long, it's probably better not to join because we do need somebody committed. And he said, oh, yeah, no, man, you know, no problem. You know, So, it, in fact, it was a problem. And he left rather soon to the, <laughs> the process. But when he came in, I was thinking, yeah, oh, Christ, you know, amazing solo player. But he was starting to write. Now, his harmonic thing wasn't fully developed at the time, but he was playing like really nice chords on the guitar. And I, of course, had to figure them out for keyboard. So I would write them all out and thought, yeah, this, this guy's got something going on. It was after he left the band that he fully formed, I think, his harmonic universe. And I followed it, you know, since then and listened to it and been amazed by it. In fact, I was teaching Baron a Holdsworth tune um, about six months ago. We were messing around with it, made a recording of it 
wonderful chords, just beautiful. And, um, uh, you know, I, I was um, really pleased to see that Baron could just play those shapes because some of them have got huge stretches in. Yeah, and, I mean, um, Alan had really big hands that allowed him to play ones that would give tendonitis to a, a yeah. mortal. <laughs> well, I was, you know, I, I, I was trying to play some of them on guitar and my, I was injuring my, my hands, right? It was like, you know, I, I felt pain for a week afterwards trying to play some of these bloody shapes. I can imagine. And Baron's hands are smaller than mine, and yet he could effortlessly get his finger. I suppose it's the kind of thing you just develop of knowing how to, you know, bend your fingers into the right shapes, uh, an ability I lack. I'm still, I'm still stuck on E and A. But um, Baron can do it, you know, and all power to him. Let's hope that um, progress continues. Yeah, yeah. Which song did you... Uh record with baron well it's kind of a secret because i don't, okay. I don't want i don't even want baron to know which one it is <laughs> and the reason being if i tell him which one it is he'll, he'll go on youtube right and he'll he'll start listening to other people play it and i don't want him to do that i want him to find his own way with it Fair so enough. that will have you have to remain a closely guarded secret i'm afraid yeah you know while we were on the subject of Rupert band um i was recently watching the uh old gray whistle test uh, the one from with feels good to me on it and uh, back to the beginning. You have any memories of that uh, that visit there with the oh, yes. Whispering Bob? Oh yes, um, Whispering Bob. Yeah, can you speak up, Bob? We need to get a level. Is is he talking? I think he's talking. Um, so what happened is um, we were going to do a UK tour. Alan had declared he was no longer in the band before we did it, which wasn't very helpful. Um, but, but Bill made him stick to his original uh, vow of doing it. So that made for a somewhat uncomfortable atmosphere. Although Alan was pretty cheerful 70% of the time. Um, the gigs were all booked. And then Bill said, oh, by the way, we're doing a TV show. And I said, okay, great, when is it? And it was before the tour started. And I thought, oh, that's a shame because, you know, it would have been nicer to have played the stuff in, done a few dates and then filmed it. But that's the way it was. And I've been off the road now for a whole year writing material with Bill for the band and writing my own material for the band. So I was a bit kind of out of practice of gigging and approached the occasion with, with more nerves than I would have done normally. When I arrived at the, the venue, um, I found that they'd surrounded my keyboards with about six cameras and they were in front of me, behind me, to the side of me. And the director came over and said, oh, we thought we'd start with a few shots of you. <laughs> oh, great, fantastic. Um, no pressure then. So we started playing uh, cameras on me. I'm thinking, oh, you know, they're not gonna give me another chance at this. We've got a live audience, I better get it right. And uh, it was all right for a bit. And I was thumping along happily and said, yeah, yeah, and you know, it was rocking and uh, I was enjoying it. And I managed to forget the occasion and got over my initial nerves. But unaccountably on one of the tunes, about two thirds of the way in, something happened in my brain. I think it must have been some chemical breakdown of the adrenaline you feel when you go on. I believe it does induce hallucinogenic state sometimes. <laughs> but I suddenly cut to the code of a song before we'd even played the middle section and couldn't understand why the rest of the band weren't playing the same bit. And everyone looked up at me and I'm like, what's the, what's the problem? And then I realized what I'd done, I said, oh, Jesus. I suddenly cut back to the middle eight, you know, managed to kind of cover it up. And afterwards it was like, um, I said, I'm really sorry, Bill, you know, I kind of lost the plot about this. Oh yeah, you know, it's all right. You know, fine. We managed to pull it off and like, things like that. Audiences don't notice, you know, it, as long as you don't actually stop playing. And if long, as long as you keep smiling, it generally goes unnoticed, but it was a major blunder. And of course it's immortalized. And one day I'll figure out, I'll watch the video, figure out where it went wrong. So that was my first date with the Bruford Band. Wow. Okay. So that was before you even played any live gigs or anything. You did the show. Yeah. It was. Wow. It was a live gig as, as of sorts in front of a, a bunch of drunken students uh, in Oxford. But it was. It had the feel of a TV show all the way through. Excellent. Well, uh, it's nice that somebody got that on um, and recorded it because it's it's really priceless footage. Yeah, it's, you know, it's good to look back and see the band as it was. And I mean, yeah, it was, it was a good band, you know. To, I mean, playing with um, Jeff and Alan, that was tremendous for me, you know. I'd not played with musicians of that caliber before. They were, they were outrageous. 
Yeah, really wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff. Mm, and I think it mm. stood the test of time nicely. Mm. Yeah, and it great. continues to inspire decades later. So well, thank that's, you. That's, that's nice. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, get back to um, your timeline with Barb. Yeah. Um, you, you had mentioned the, the success that came from It's My Party. Um, did that inspire other similar covers down the road later? Yeah, uh, in a way uh, it did, uh, but it was more a matter of practicality than inspiration. So we had this one off it, you know, it was a, it was a kind of, we d I did it as a joke and um, it amused me to hear Bob sing it, but the music on it was, um, was not throwaway. It had some nice movements and it had some nice sounds in it. Um, Bob's backing vocals sounded tremendous because she's such a great singer. And her voice, her voice had this incredible appeal that, that I'd always um, noticed, you know, every time I'd heard her sing. So we'd had a huge hit record. We'd flown around the world promoting it. And we obviously, there was a lot of um, pressure on us to, to follow up the single, um, but we had no more material. So I couldn't write songs quickly to order. I needed time. And so what we thought would be, sensible to do was do some more covers because at least the songs were there and we could concentrate on doing a nice version so we did um we did a few interesting covers i thought um one of my favorite ones was i'm in a different world which was by the four tops so again we get back to that tamla motown thing that i lived through when i was 14 or 15. it's a lovely old song and it's got really nice vocal harmonies on the chorus um kind of answering lines sung in three-part harmony um I kind of got in touch with my funky self um, and did some nice like kind of funky bit in the middle and a bit of a solo, keyboard solo, you know, which is never far away with our music. And um, yeah, that did okay. Um, we also did a very elaborate version of um, an old uh, film song called Busy Doing Nothing, which um, was comedic, but I did a fairly deep musical deconstruction of it. and borrowed bits of the old arrangement, which was a very nice kind of Hollywood style um, film soundtrack thing with an orchestra, but um, also put in like electric drums, uh, electric guitar, sort of rock middle eight, um, and some, uh, it changed the verse around completely. So it was all about kind of quite um, dark sounding prophet uh, arpeggio, prophet five being my synth at the time. I was um, playing some nice like um, repeated riffs, almost like Terry Riley, like, you know, hypnotic kind of patterns. Oh yeah. So it's cramming a lot in there, you know, and uh, it's a very elaborate arrangement and people really liked it. And to this day, people ask me about it and say they enjoyed it. But none of these recordings were, um, were big hits in the, in the vein of It's My Party, but we did manage to put together um, a sides and B sides and those B sides were my first steps into writing original material for the Stuart Gaskin project and I thought I thought you know some of the songs were pretty good um, Barb and I were recently talking about the B side of it's my party was called waiting in the wings and that was something I wrote in about an hour and a half in the studio I just sat down I put down a click track uh, consisting of a kind of metal kind of hi-hat sound on a Simmons SDS-5 electronic drum kit triggered by a Lindrum. Uh, so you just got this metallic kind of pulse. Going dee, 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 dee. And then I changed the sound of the hi-hat every so often, timed it so that it would play a certain amount of beats in the chorus. I think it was a 19 beat pattern in the chorus. Went back to 4-4 four, four for the verses and then sat down and played piano chords along with it. I knew where I was in the arrangement because I kind of sketched it out. So I came back and I had a piano and a hi-hat. Uh, the piano was playing this quirky rhythm on the choruses. And um, I took it home that night and I wrote the words and brought them back the next day and Bob sung them. And then we started putting on extra keyboards. I overdubbed the Prophet 5 synth um vocoder sounds etc cetera, etc cetera. it came out really nice it was a sort of early synth pop um thing that came out at the time when synths were just starting to make their mark in uk pop music and then you got a lot of bands that were doing that stuff like um, um heaven 17 who i think turned into depeche mode um thomas dolby 
um, who we befriended um, around about 1981, who, you know, as you know, made fantastic um, original pop music using synths and drum machines. So it was a whole kind of, whole kind of movement. Um, it, a lot of it sounded very synthetic, but it was deliberately so. It wasn't like, um, you know, let's, let's make the music sound cheap. We thought these sounds were really good at the time. So the do, do, do syndrome, we thought that was kind of cool, you know, sure. but brief, briefly. Um, nowadays it sounds a bit stupid, but um, yeah, we, we felt, you know, like it was something new. And I have to say, you know, I didn't get the same feeling of freshness from my latter work with the bands I was in, that I'd ended up in the Bruford band. We, we had a kind of original direction emerging with Bill and I used to do these electronic type things, but he broke the band up before we got a chance to really explore it. That would have been quite a new direction, but yeah. you know, there, w there was no longer the opportunity to do it with him. Um, so never mind. Um, did you, so I did it. Did Sorry, was there on. a feeling at the beginning of the eighties that you were embarking on a fresh era? Because looking back now, you know, all the sense and such really, created a, a fresh palette for that decade in a lot of ways. Yeah, I thought, I'd felt um, that with National Health, when I was writing stuff for National Health, I didn't feel that it, it had the same spark as when I was writing stuff for my earlier bands, particularly with Egg, because that was also new and exciting. But with National Health, I was getting a little bit uh, jaded is too strong a word, but I was feeling that, that there weren't so many obvious avenues I could explore that would be would, would be fresh and different and progressive, which was what the, you know, some a, a tag we got stuck with, which we didn't like, but it did at least have an indication that your music might progress. And, um, you know, I felt, you know, I was finding it harder to progress in that kind of genre in the company of those musicians, some of whom were mostly concerned with like what they were going to play on a track and were principally moved by the prospect of playing a solo um, as opposed to let's make a great arrangement or let's make a great production. It was a kind of me first kind of attitude that came from some of the players. And I wasn't into that. I wanted to produce really good sounding tracks with good production. I didn't think I'd be able to do it. Um, in the context of a national health band. Um, so, and when Bill broke broke up the Bruford band, uh, it was like, okay, I've reached the point now, I'm gonna do it on my own because um, this is the only, way to, the only way to make any progress now. It was certainly a fresh start for me and for others. Um, I remember talking to Jacko Jackchick about it. Um, he was like a, a lot younger than me, but he was turning me on to early tracks by U2 when they first started and they were a really interesting sounding fresh band from from Ireland and we went together to see bands like Huang Chung who were very different from other bands at the time and I never bought into any of the movements the new wave movement the punk movement you know this and that because I'm not a movement kind of guy I'm just into music but I could see something new happening and I happened to like the sound of synths and electric drums and all that so it was yeah it was a great time and um it um it was a new lease of life for me. I've never looked back. Did you um welcome all these new boards and such with open arms? I mean, you know, it's easy to look back decades later and go, Oh, those vintage sounds from the seventies were so wonderful and warm and rich. And out of tune. But <laughs> I get the impression that when you were in the the thick of it, it was like, you know, new technology was a godsend and let's out with the old, in with the new, keep moving forward. Was that well, the feeling or yeah, was well, it like, you know, I really still need my Mellotron also. <laughs> well, when when I went on tour with, with Bill in America, I insisted on taking my Hammond organ, right? Which he which he's never forgiven me for because he blames all the financial losses of the band <laughs> on that on that in that poor unsuspecting <laughs> organ. Um he, he is temporarily forgotten that he had rather a lot of drum cases as well, which also needed to be paid for in air freight. But um, yeah, I dragged my hand along because it was like my, my security blanket. You know, it's my organ I played since I was um, 18. So um, 17, 18, 19, whenever I bought it, I think it was, I think it was 18 actually. But um, yeah, but then when I, when that band was over, um, I'd started playing the Prophet 5, which Bill, kindly bought for me in an act of supreme generosity he said 
I think you should check out this new synth. And we went around to the music shop together and the manager said, oh yeah, we, we were wondering when you'd, you'd be coming in. And he, he wheeled out the Prophet 5 synth and I went in the back room and played it and I thought, these sounds are terrible. Um, <laughs> they sound awful. They're weedy, um, horrible little synthetic sounds. I thought, I, I can't play this stuff. And then I started turning a few knobs and I thought, oh, wait a minute, hang on. You can actually make this thing sound quite fat and ballsy. So the manager said, why don't you take it home, see how you get on. And within a week, I, this thing had changed my life. It was like I was making outrageously powerful sounds on it. I could flatten a whole room with just one note, the same way that a lead guitarist can by playing a power chord, you know. Yeah. I used to do that with my Hammond by blasting it through a fuzz box and I would flattened the hairs in people's ears and i the prophet was like in the same vein it was really bollocking instrument and that became my sound um the the hammond was you know temporarily put aside so i had to profit five and then i managed to get hold of a mini moog and these were quite expensive instruments but as i say bill bought the prophet initially later on i bought it back from him managed to scrape together the money for a mini moog and what i used to do was play the the prophet with my right hand and the uh, the Moog set to a bass patch with my left. Oh, yeah. And I would write whole arrangements like that in real time, playing the bass line with my left hand and some simple five note chords on the Prophet or four note chords as may be. Whole arrangements came out then. I've got cassettes full of this stuff and they they do sound even now to me quite fresh and, and uh, exciting, you know, because it's just the, these instruments were, and, and me just, just clicked. We, we um, that was it. That was it for me really. Was the Prophet one that you had at the onset of the Bruford Band, or did you get it a little later? Because I feel like I hear it a lot on the Tornado record, but not as much on the other two. On on Bill's first solo album, Feels Good To Me, I didn't play Prophet, I don't believe. Yeah, I don't in fact, it may not have been available in the UK at that point. On the Feels Good To Me, I'd been playing it for some time, and it was featured from our very first gig. I think you'll see me playing it on that Rock Goes to College show. Yeah. And it was starting to become, well, it was actually my dominant sound. Um, and it then became second nature to me, uh, to me to play it, and it became my principal instrument, yeah. So it would have come to the fore more in the later recordings because that was my first instrument of choice with every track yeah okay yeah well it's, it's a great sound and yeah it's aged quite well you know looking oh, yeah. back on a lot of these yeah. sounds you know like the hammond is just a timeless sound that oh yeah will yeah. never go out of style it just touches your heart in a way it's an incredible instrument it, yeah. it always had so much heart it's a big sound it's a big grown-up sound you know how has the Rhodes piano aged for you all these years later well i was forced to play the fender Rhodes by the um hatfield and the North guys, because they their their first choice for keyboard player was um, a guy called Dave McRae, who played with a band called Matching Mole. And Dave, Dave was like a great jazz player. And so when I joined the band, they said, uh, hey, you know, you've got, you got to play Fender Rhodes, you know. And I thought, well, all right, okay, if you insist. So we bought one out of the Virgin Advance money. And this thing showed up. Um, hours before I was due to play a gig with the band. And I thought, oh, let's play this thing on stage, see how I get on with it. And it had a beautiful bell-like sound, a fantastic sustain, but it was a bastard to play. The action was so stiff sure, uh, compared, okay. to, compared to my Hammond, which was just like, spongy. You know, playing, well, play, it's kind of like sort of very, you know, no resistance, no nothing pianistic about it. You need no force in your fingers or your arms. You just wiggle your fingers and, and you know play quick runs but on the roads it was such a nightmare playing fast runs on it and particularly because as i said the band wanted a, a fast fluid jazz thing going down and when we did tunes like phil miller's underdub which i played on that instrument then i got to solo over the changes and you know i needed to keep keep the um, the speed of the runs up but it was torture it really was hard um but you know, it was a good sound. It fitted this. It, it defined the sound of that band quite strongly. Um, used it a lot on the records. So, uh, but I don't play it now. I'd now play a sampled version um, made by Eric Persing's company, Spectrasonics, and really, that is so much less painful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you how you feel about these modern equivalents, and you know, to me, it seems like in the '80s, 
they couldn't emulate vintage sounds or really wanted to you know you get that dx7 sort of oh yeah cheap roads 80 sound <laughs> that's not but, yeah that's not a road sound yeah no. but in the last 20 25 years it seems like emulations have gotten really close you know some of these brands like nord and other boards like that seem to have really nailed it um and i suppose yeah, now there's lots of soft yeah. sense and other things you can just use on your laptop that will get you there as well Absolutely, there's an enormous choice. The Nord stuff is very good quality. Um, they've managed to, that company made a commitment to providing fairly deeply sampled real real keyboard sounds and giving you lots of velocity layers. So it does sound fairly natural. Um, with soft synths and sample libraries, the advantage is that we now have disc streaming. So you can have huge libraries and there's one piano that I reviewed, um, which had a hundred velocity layers, you know, and that's wow. quite common now, hundred layers, you know, and now drum libraries have a hundred layers. It's outrageous. So you do get, um, dynamic depth. You do get a lot of, um, variation of tone. So you're not just playing one noise over and over again, and you do get some reasonably rich lush sounds. Um, some of the orchestral stuff that I, that I've, um, used is yeah it sounds pretty lush but in terms of emulating an acoustic or electro acoustic instrument like like say the roads there is something about plugging the thing into um a speaker an amp and cranking it up a bit and micing it with the right microphone in the right cabinet and the right amp you'd probably get a better sound but you'd then have to pay repair bills on very old instruments that keep um needing constant tuning uh, are difficult to move around because they're so heavy. I can't set up my rows now. My back muscles are too weak. I have to have someone to hold the other end of it so we can <laughs> lift it up from the floor. Um, it's just expedient to use, um, you know, Eric Persing's beautiful sampled version. And, and that is a work of art, actually. Um, but um, in pop music, the kind of pop music I do, I don't believe we need to get too concerned about absolutely nailing the sounds of the 70s i think we have moved on if if you really wanted a classic hammonds and road sound yeah it would be better if you found a studio that got them or keep your instruments in good repair and um and use that and mic them up and do all that stuff we used to do in the 70s but it's a lot slower and clunky and you can't really take it on the road you know if i get um offered a gig in japan with barbara we can't take a fender Rhodes or um a hammond I seem to remember that when um, Phil Miller's band played uh, um, in Tokyo, the same promoter asked them if they would play analog instruments in order to tick that kind of 70s box. But, you know, you don't know what you're going to get from a rental company. I mean, you know, you could, you might get a Hammond that it's not in a very good state of repair. You might get a Rhodes that hasn't been tuned in a few years. I mean, right, it's not, yeah. I, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't like to risk that. Yeah, it's a little too risky. Um... Yeah. Do you have any vintage gear in your studio now? I I am surrounded by uh, I am a hoarder, can't throw anything away, and so I'm surrounded by vintage equipment. Okay. Um, I've got my Hammond in our living room here in our house, uh, which we oil once a year in a ritual ceremony, and I play. I do like to be beside the seaside on it to amuse our guests. Um, I've got my Fender Rhodes, which I haven't played in a while, which does need a service. I've got my mini Moog, which I use occasionally for bass lines on Stuart Gaskin material. I've got my Profit 5, which is broken. I could spend a thousand quid getting it repaired, but it would only break again two weeks later. So right. I bought I bought the new um, Profit 5 um, 2021 version by, by Dave Smith, which is proper analog uh, synth that sounds pretty much like my old Profit 5, um, except it's in a little desktop unit because I didn't think I could cram any more keyboards into my room. I've got about sort of 15 of them in here. So yeah, I've got an emulator sampler sitting in the corner gathering dust. Um, I had a Lindrum, but I gave it to a guy to repair and never saw it again. Um, I've got old reverb units from the eighties that cost like, you know, three, four, five thousand pounds that don't work anymore. So it's terrible, really. It's a testimony to a man with, um, too much equipment, too much time on his hands. And, uh, you know, no ability to clear out his music room when it's the time to do it. In contrast, Gavin Harrison maintains an extremely neat music room where it, with gleaming surfaces and 
always gets rid of his old kit when he stopped using it. So he's like the polar opposite of me. He's got a tidy household mind. That's awesome. That's um, that might be a good time to segue and talk a bit about your your relationship, with Gavin, and how you came to work with him. You know, for a lot of progressive rock fans, you know, they know him as one of the three drummers in King Crimson at this time, which was a, a daring idea just to put three yeah. drummers at the front of the stage. But yeah, you know, Gavin Gavin arranged everything in such a way that it's almost like they're sharing one brain. And I don't think I've ever seen that done before. I've seen a lot of bands with two drummers, you know, the Almond Brothers, the Grateful Dead, you know, people like that. But it was more like percussionist meets kit player in those bands. And here it's mm. almost like they are one one brain. <laughs> and it's wonderful, you know. I think that just kind of goes along with the whole King Crimson kind of directive to push forward and do fresh things, even if you're playing old material. So, well, yeah. my, my under my understanding of how that lineup came together was that Robert Fripp, who I, I met once in New York, and was a perfectly nice fellow, um, wanted to, you know, enter a kind of social comfort zone because he'd had so much argument and strife with the earlier versions of King Crimson, arguing about everything, you know, constant bickering, resentment, and you know, you don't want that in a band, man. It's like, you know, if you if you if your family was like that, you'd, you'd disown them. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, if, if your wife was like that, if she was just kind of unpleasant the whole time, you, you'd divorce, you know? So um, he didn't want any more of that. And he'd been fighting his legal battles to get the rights to his music back. And, and you know, well done, Robert Fripp, for doing that. You know, hats off to you, sir. Because um, Absolutely. He's, he stood up to the music business and, and got them to do the right thing. He, yeah, he didn't want a lo load more bickering. So he got people in that he knew could get on with. And um, Gavin is a very amenable personality. Jacko is funny to have around and, you know, musically quick. He's got a great voice and a good laugh. You know, he does very funny impersonations. Bill Rieflin was in the band. Um, I'm sure Bill's a great drummer and that. But, you know, he was a close family friend of Fripp and his wife. Pat had worked with the band before and is, again, a very amenable personality. Mel's not a guy who causes problems musically. He gets up and plays great solos. Tony, ultimate professional. So you had there a, a kind of band that was chosen, I believe, partly for, you know, personality reasons. Then there was the kind of um, dramatic idea of putting the drums up the front, having three drummers. But... I think that you needed somebody with a powerful musical brain like Gavin to make that work because I don't think Robert Fripp knew how it would work, but he knew these guys would come to some kind of agreement. So um, in the past, you used to get two drummers and they both play Hell for Leather and it was just a bloody mess. They just, you know, thrash away and it was, it looked good, but it sounded terrible. Gavin knew from day one that they couldn't afford to do that. It had to be much more intelligent. So basically he worked out drum parts that he was going to play and said, look, if I play this on this section, how about I don't play my cymbals, but you add cymbals or you play the kit for this bit and I'll just lay out and not play at all and Bill can do something different. And so it went on and he kind of became the MD of the rhythm section, you know, the, the, uh, the, the three drum guys. So he fulfilled a vital kind of sub MD role, which without which it would have been a mess. And even though Gav was doing that, uh, it was not the most comfortable thing to achieve because you needed a huge amount of PA channels. It was challenging um, to, to balance that, that acoustic uproar that those three drummers are doing. Because Gavin plays very loud nowadays, right? He, um, he doesn't hold back. And I'll tell you about recording with Gavin in a bit. Um, but yeah, it, need, it needed his brain to sort it out. And I don't think, I have to say, I don't think it was a good idea on paper, but I think they made the best of it that they could possibly have done. Well, I think it made for a, a fresh era and the fact that they were tackling all of the catalog, playing things that they hadn't touched since the 70s, yeah. but giving it a fresh spin um, was just a great way to go about it. You know, you know, yeah. some people tried to write it off as a nostalgia act, but I saw them three or four times and they're... There was really nothing nostalgic about it. It was it was very very fresh. Yeah, yeah. It was that you know just that just that simple um, instrumentation idea 
right there it's very dramatic and it would make everything immediately sound different so that yeah in that sense it was a good idea yeah. well i was just happy to see him wind up with crimson because i feel like yeah. he was influencing them anyway i i recall bill mentioning that gavin had written a number of books and that he and Pat had been digging into those back in the 90s when they were doing their double trio thing. So mm. it just seems proper that Gavin finally winds up in King Crimson. So. Yeah, it was a good, it was a really good fit. Uh, he suited the band because their music is um, quite technical and um, involves a lot of um, counting on your fingers up to 17, you know, and then Gavin is really good at that. I mean, he's, yeah, he's I good. just think yeah. he deserved to reach a wider audience. I mean, he, yeah, he, he met, you know, a, a lot of people came to know him through his work with, with Stephen Wilson, yeah. Porcupine Tree, but you know, that's still sort of a niche and King Crimson casts a wider net. So it was, well, it did, yeah, but I actually, you know, in terms of audience reach, um, Porcupine Tree was doing great. And it was it was um, in terms of the venues they were playing. They're playing far bigger venues than Crimson were. Really? Um, okay. Th this may partly be due to the fact that um, Mr. Fritt at, at one stage didn't want to play theatres that were bigger than two thousand because he thought it had a detrimental effect on the engagement with the audience and the sound. So, but in crude industry terms, I mean, um, as as I recall, Porcupine Tree played it. Was it Radio City, New York? Yeah, um, maybe so, yeah. they pl I think they played the Albert Hall in London. I mean, these are really great big venues, you know, and they were very, very popular. But then oh, Steve you. Wilson pulled the plug on it, you know, so they, they weren't able to. The, I believe they would have gone on to bigger and better things. Um, but they, oh. you know, Stephen Wilson wanted to go solo. So, that, so Gavin didn't want to join in with that. So that was the end of that particular um, liaison. Well, absence makes the heart grow fonder, it seems, because <laughs> now that they reunited Porcupine Tree, it's the yeah. hot ticket this year. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, All's well yes. that ends well, well, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. They've got the, um, yeah, they've they've certainly got a um, quite a big tour there in terms of like um, the costs of doing it and the, you know, it's, it's an expensive thing to put on the road, so I'm told. Oh, I can imagine probably more now so than ever, you know, more, so, than, more than ever. I, I yeah, think, yeah. you know, let's hope, let's hope they get the big audiences they're hoping for. I think they will have a great turnout no matter what they do and no matter what it costs. So yeah, kudos to yeah. them. I, I wish them the best. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. So tell me a bit about more about how you came to know Gavin and bring him into. Yeah. The so when, in about 1976, National Health did a gig in London <clears throat> at a, a, a posh concert venue called the Queen Elizabeth Hall. And after the gig, a young lad um, called Jacko Jackshit came around to the dressing room with a tape of his band, who called 64 Spoons. And he said, oh, we like, we like what you do. Um, we like National Health, uh, you, you know. And um, we use the same intro tape that you use. And he um, explained it. It was, it was a tape of a... Uh, a terrible orchestra called the Portsmouth Symphonia doing a version of 2001 uh, theme. And it's dreadful, you know, they're all playing the wrong notes and coming in at the wrong time. <laughs> stuff. And we, we used to shamble on stage to that. And so did his band, 64 Spoons. So I listened to the, uh, the tape of 64 Spoons and I thought, oh yeah, you know, this guy's good, good singer, decent guitar player, and sort of got involved with working with Jacko. He played on uh, all of the early Stuart Gaskin tracks that required guitar, and um, we had a we had a very strong musical relationship for a few years. While we were working with Jacko, he said, "I've got to play you a tape of this this drummer I found. He's amazing. He's called Gavin Harrison." So he put a tape on, and we listened to it, and it sounded to me like someone was playing um, really kind of slow kick drum and snare backbeat doomed bat boom bat doom bat, and had overdubbed a kind of 30 second note hi-hat moving at the speed of light right <laughs> and i listened to that and i thought well that's that's really tight playing i thought i don't know how he managed to keep in time when he overdubbed the hi-hat um a little while later we showed up at the same studio and gavin was there i think he was aged about 20 or 21 he's doing a session with jacko or somebody and um I said, oh, yeah, I heard your tape. Yeah, really good. I said, um, I was amazed at the way you overdubbed the hi-hat over that backbeat. He said, that wasn't an overdub. I said, what, you played all that live? He said, yeah. 
I was like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, fucking hell. So I realized then he was an amazing technical drummer. So um, we got chatting um, and I knew he was very efficient and I knew he put a premium on playing in time to click tracks, which is very important when you're doing click-based pop music. So I invited him to do a bit of light overdubbing on some Stuart Gaskin tunes. He played um, a bit of cymbals, programmed some hi-hat for me on a tune called The Sixties Never Die. So, you know, I ended up going around to his house quite a bit and we got really, really close uh, friendship going. And we used to sit for hours and just talk about music and a lot of the, his views on music chimed with mine. He's quite a deep musical thinker and he's aware of the psychology of performing. Um, so we we talk around that. It was really, really interesting. We also like both hated the music business, so there was a lot to moan about. <laughs> um, and um, it got to the point where Barb and I were, were putting together some tracks for a project that ended up being called The Big Idea Album that came out, I think, in about 1989, around about that time, possibly slightly earlier. And we had this mega epic called New, New Jerusalem, which was a long song. It was a kind of political rant about the dangers of nationalism um and it's the lyrics are as pertinent now as they were then it um you know pre predated donald trump and the rise of populism and all that horrible shit but it was complaining about that tendency and we had that going on in british politics and kind of a warning um, yeah it's like a kind of warning yeah like a, a, a you know a precursor of doom and it was, it was warning people that you know you know like being proud of your country is one thing like i'm proud of the beatles you know and i'm proud of um, the english countryside and the cornish beaches and and all that stuff but i'm not proud of being english per se because we're better than anybody else we're just a bunch of bozos like everybody else mm -hmm. um we happen to be a certain color we might as well be black um brown sort of off white off black off brown beige spotted Perfect. polka dot um gold leaf you know it doesn't matter does it i mean what you're looking for is like a sort of good people with good hearts and yeah, it's what's that, inside that counts yeah it's what's inside exactly and so you know when you start getting nationalistic you start getting the stupid idea that you're better or different from everybody else and that just doesn't work and it leads to all sorts of terrible problems so the song was about that um 10 minute epic lots of lots of sections big sound big church organ in the middle 20 piece welsh choir you know like and gavin was going to play on it and we needed like a big drum sound so we we opened the doors to the the live room that he was in it had quite a lively sound but it was adjacent to a very big stone room with nothing in it, it was incredibly re reverberant so we opened the doors to that room and the, the sound of his kit spilled into the room and we recorded it in stereo and compressed the hell out of it and that mixed in with Gavin's control room drums just sounded immense. You know, it was the big kind of public image type drum sound. Yeah. Um, we got to the ending of the song and it was going to go into the final chorus. And generally speaking, the song is a big halftime feel, feel, I should say. And I said to Gav, look, I don't want you just to go doom, baff, doom. And I don't want you to go doom, baff, doom, baff. Can you do something in between? And he said, yep, I've got an idea. And he disappeared into the control room for five minutes, made a few notes in his manuscript book. So, right, I got it, roll tape. And then he started playing something that was, I think it's based on a kind of 12 pattern with the occasional odd number bars to bring him back in line with what the rest of us were doing. Uh, very odd, indeed, and very kind of angular. And it just worked perfectly. It was um, kind of, you know, it was sort of, um, what's the word? unsettling disturbing rhythm mm. but it grooved along it was very powerful and i was blasting away on the profit on top of it with the sort of distortion pedal and the whole thing was just epic you know and it was lovely and at the, at the end of it he, he played this stonking great fill that went on for about 10 seconds it's what we call the great british rock ending you know where you hit every drum in your kit six times as fast as you can and then with an enormous crash and he he didn't have a click um i don't think we certainly didn't have a click for this last bit because we stopped the click and he was doing a huge fill and just by purely by chance he just ended on exactly the right beat <laughs> and if and if you and he, bash and the echo died away and we all 
wipe the sweat from our brows. And then if you listen closely to the record, you can he does a little giggle just as it fades out because he'd nailed it. Uh, it's a great moment. It's this uh, young drummer just uh, rising to the occasion. And, you know, he's really taken things to a, a new level, you know. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, people look at, like, the gentleman that played with Rush from Canada back in the 70s, Neil. And he definitely pushed things up a notch or two when it came to precise technical drumming. But I think Gavin just took it to a whole new orbit, you know. Um, the thing is, with, yeah, no, I, I, I entirely agree with you. I think he kind of, to some extent, um, reinvented certain aspects of rhythm because he he first of all went off on this thing he called rhythmic displacement where you play you play a regular rock beat but you do it a kind of eighth note out of out of time with everybody else sure. and uh, that's kind of funny you know but then he got into a thing called rhythmic modulation where you play some kind of uh, like if you're playing a four for one two three four and then you put in fast threes like da, ga, 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 and that becomes the new pulse and you modulate to that what were your, th your fast threes become your four b and so it's a sort of you know mutation it's very hard to figure out um he he would write it all down figure out how to play it and on some occasions on stage he'd be playing I believe in seven eight with one hand and five eight on the other, and he can even do three way um, unmatched meters with, with his foot doing a third meter. So it's just preposterous. I think the way he does it is he writes it all out and learns it um, parrot fashion. You know, okay, that beat comes here and I do that. But when you hear it, it's uh, it's outrageous, uh, incredible. And oh. other drummers uh, have done well to to follow his lead. I mean, he's he's issued several um, education books which lay out all these ideas, notated so other drummers can can pick up on it. As, and I think you said, didn't some of the Crimson guys use those rhythms? Maybe Bill played one of the rhythms on on what, a Crimson track or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely goes back a few decades now. Isn't it? Yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. think he was. No, probably... it's 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 good stuff and. You know, personally, what I'd like to hear Gav do is, is do more of his solo stuff because he did a. Did you ever hear his solo album? I remember one where he reimagined Porcupine Tree songs. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, they were they were frankly unrecognizable. I mean, they bore very little resemblance, if any, to the Porcupine Tree material. But Lawrence Cottle, a bass player, a friend of Gavin's, came in and um, wrote these elaborate compositions based on tiny fragments of. Um, porcupine tree material it's a bit like trout mass replica i mean you had captain beefart don vliet used to plonk about on the piano and play these sort of funny little patterns and then the rest of the band had to turn it into music and um i'm not saying <laughs> i'm not saying that porcupine tree tunes are kind of terrible i'm saying that the very little of them was used in the in the arrangements no, it's like you a fragment and let it inspire something new just a few notes or a bass riff or something you know and it's like okay yeah, let me let me run with that and of course he, he just came up with something completely original actually and um gavin did some insane playing on it and the, the arrangements were really good it's got an overall jazz big band sound but there's one track on it that i recommend to people called heart attack in a lay by which is it sounds more like contemporary orchestral music it's got a lot of woodwinds on it it's a fantastic piece of work yeah great stuff um i guess uh it makes me wonder about how you wound up was the gavin connection how you met stephen wilson and wound up orchestrating some things for him later yeah yeah i've been working with gavin a lot he played on he played on most once he'd played on the big idea he he um he also played on the next album and he played on all the star clocks which i'll tell you about in a bit because it's quite funny but um yes through gavin gavin then joined porcupine tree and um they were recording an album and they were looking for a string arranger and gavin invited me to have a go at it so i wrote a kind of um something I thought they'd like based on the part of it had a kind of Bollywood kind of sound. You know, if you know Indian. Yeah, um, yeah, pop, Indian pop music, yeah. Indian pop music. They, they do all these kind of glides between notes on the violins, and it's a really attractive sound. You don't and get it. Locally, you know, like, they do it too, you know. They're, yeah, sure. Their sense yeah. of microtones is, of course, amazing. Yeah, beautiful, liquid-sounding music. So I wrote, I wrote some melody lines um, <clears throat> which came in in a certain section that were very kind of Bollywood and the band really liked it and um, subsequently did some more stuff with, with them. But mainly actually 
did a lot of Steve Wilson's solo album string parts and choir parts, um, did arrangements for him. I would come in and produce the sessions and, you know, got to know him a little through that. Very nice chap. Very easy to work with. Um, very professional. He knows what he likes. He lets you try things. If he doesn't like them, he tells you. You don't do them. No hard feelings. He generally likes most of what I do, which is uh, good. And so I come up with you know the scores uh, Barbara helps with that actually she's a very good copyist and so she helps to create the scores that the players work from we were in the habit of going up to London to record uh, the players but we've stopped doing that now for obvious reasons um, but um, yeah it's something I enjoy doing as a sideline arranging for strings is always pleasant and when you hear the band the string players that is coming together in a group to play the parts it's very very nice because they're the best session players in the country and they play beautifully together you they can play a piece of music and you think they've been playing it all their lives and actually they're just reading it I've never never seen it before sure. fantastic thing yeah. amazing they, um yeah. they yeah they're great readers and but you know they also do this thing where they all swell and fade at the same time they put in beautiful um ebb and flow dynamics and, and it's not written in the parts they just feel it and they feel it collectively so that's a that's a great thing definitely enjoyed a lot of Steven's work over the years you know I, mm, I really yeah. love his production values as well whenever you get yeah. a record from yeah. him you know it's going to sound pristine and, and rich and clear yes and, and um and it, Gavin's drums were always captured really well on those yeah. records as, yeah yeah you know so it was well, kind of a, a treat to hear it you know you don't yeah. hear a kit that size mic'd up so well all the little doodads and stuff on it you hear everything equally clear and yeah, it's, it's just kind of a treat you know I'm, yeah you know, i agree i agree just to sit back and listen to it from a sonic perspective as i spent a lot of time in gavin's studio i i was um able to hear his drum sound evolving over the years and his process was to buy good microphones and a good um, a good sound card and record digitally so there was no issues with hiss or whatever and then he would occasionally go off and do a session for somebody and he'd come back and he'd say oh I got this great mic i discovered for bass drum i'm going to get one and he'd trade in his old bass drum mic and buy a, a new one and then it would be like oh i've had the great overheads and the, the overhead mics are the the heart of the kit in recording i've got this great great overheads so I'm, I'm not going to use these old ones anymore and he, he kept sort of trading up you know and he ended up with a superb set of mics and then he would feed his live room into the mix but it was always a little difficult to start with because it was untamable it was like this great roaring Taj Mahal kind of ambience you'd feed it in and maybe if you were doing a kind of cheerful pop song yeah you didn't want the Taj Mahal you wanted more like the church <laughs> right. the Something church little... hall you know the the kind of uh, the the sort of the wooden room but you didn't want the um you know the cathedral so Gav got this really cool new compressor and for some reason, what it does is it squashes the live room down and it's got various presets on it that you can say, right, we want the big New Jerusalem sound for this one. Then, but we want the small poppy one for like this song, like a, we, a track on Star Clocks called Driz Drizzle Cloaks, yeah? Um, that didn't need a big, huge reverb. So we just used the live room, but with a different compressor setting on it. Magically, it all started working and that was the moment recording star clocks when gavin's sound really broke through for me it, where i thought i can't imagine a better drum sound like this coming out of coming out of gavin's house you know uh, his drum sounded superb he he tunes them really really well the only downside is that you know like i like to be there when people are playing on our tracks i don't buy into this remote session thing so i would i would visit gavin in um in his house and i would go in the control room where his kit is set up and we talk about the arrangement and he'd make a few notes on paper and he'd say okay um you start you start recording and i'll play and then um see where we get to so i'd sit there and his kit is like six feet away and you know, the, the counting would come and there'd be like this sound like the bombing of dresden would start <laughs> and i'd be i'd have headphones clamped over my ears for grim death and be cowering down putting my head down <laughs> so about the firing line you know while this thunder was going behind me 
and, and it was like you you couldn't think you know you couldn't and at the end of it gav would say is that any good and i said oh, I'm, I'm sorry gav we'll have to play it back because i really couldn't tell you so he'd, he'd come over i'd take my headphones off we would listen to it and the first take was always great second take was even better and he'd say i'm just gonna do one more take and i'm just gonna try some wild stuff some wild feels i'm gonna push the boat i think i've got it there in take two and he'd go through it and he'd do some crazy fills and he'd say what do you think and i say hey tell you what just do really crazy even crazier ones for me will you can you really just go bonkers and he'd say oh yeah i think i've got one you want he did a wonderful fill on the front of um, my solo on summer in the city on star clocks i love that philly place there it's like it's got the kind of keith moon attitude but it's played in time <laughs> so what it's, a concept. <laughs> it's gavin doesn't play out of time ever and when we started working with him with Baron, preparing for this live concert, um, Baron's mates had wound him up about Gavin. Because I told him we'd be working with this drummer, Gavin Harris, and he was like, oh, yeah, cool, you know, but he he'd never heard of Gavin. But some of his friends said, oh, man, you know, fucking hell, Gavin Harrison, you know, he's, a, he's the real deal. Um, Baron saw him on YouTube and started panicking. <laughs> 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 we got to his house and I said, he said, oh, gee, I didn't raise this Gavin Harris. I said, look, you know, he's fine he's just a friendly guy like me and you you know nothing to worry about but i said but if you speed up he will kill you <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't help calm him down but he's eventually got to know him and he now plays uh, as, as a guest in gavin's band uh the, the pineapple thief so that's all good yeah um yeah but you know recording in gavin's house is, is a bit of a trial by fire but he he does great performances and he does them very quickly and um he then you know, you go to the cafe, you have a sandwich, you moan about your record company, you come back. He said, I'm just going to edit those tracks I did. And he goes, bosh, 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 cut, cut. Oh, I think that's a bit early. Wait a minute. Bomb, 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 cut, splice, done. In a folder. Right. Where do you want it? On your hard drive. Right. Good. Great. Another cup of tea. I mean, it's just so quick. It's unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, I would. he would always be my first, uh, first choice drummer if he was available but of course he is often not um he's got all these big jobs to do but maybe things will quieten down a bit after he's um finished with porcupine tree early next year yeah yeah so you plan to have him on the next record whenever he's available. well i do I, I don't think he's going to be able to play on the current album he does play on one track that we'd already got in the can but i think mostly for this next album it's going to be my my famous drum programming <laughs> and gavin's agreed that i can use certain samples and bits of loops and stuff which i'll um, credit him for appropriately so i'm actually quite enjoying getting back to drum programming I used to do a lot of that in the early days um you know and if i if i put my mind to it i think i'm reasonably good at it i've got some great new sounds so i think we'll be okay really in the rhythm department yeah i'm sure that'll work out fine yeah yeah should be cool well so tell me a little bit about star clocks and kind of let me ask you this when you're embarking on a new record do you have a, a game plan or is it more like you just start amassing tracks and once you have a pile of them it's like okay this has kind of become a record yeah it's it's that is pretty much it it's not a kind of um, thing where you say well we, we have a concept for an album or we need certain songs that fit together into a kind of overall scheme we do tend to just kind of i mean it's it's governed by my output of songs which is rather slow and um i would occasionally become inspired and write you know two or three new songs and play them to barb and maybe we'd get a guide vocal on them or maybe i just sort of you know just play the backing track sometimes and um, we wouldn't take it any further what's been happening in recent years is we get an invite to play a gig somewhere uh, usually tokyo and that puts a kind of a sort of flame under the whole thing and starts heating everything up it's like okay well if we're going to tokyo in november or whenever we've got to have this thing finished beforehand so suddenly there's a deadline and i realized that i'm unless i have a deadline i do tend to just let things go on forever so the deadline for star clocks was um live live gigs we had to crack on and get it done i missed the deadline for our london date with gavin on drums but I managed to meet it for our ensuing Tokyo gigs in 2018. And we were able to play tracks from it for the concert guys in, in Japan, which was great. Um, so, but that's, that's what makes it speed up and turn into an album. You know, I like to have, if possible, 10 
or maybe nine tracks if if they're on the long side the new album is probably going to be nine tracks because the songs are all quite long it will it'll be over an hour of new music which i think you probably don't want to listen to in one sitting anyway because you know the format of old vinyl albums was you would you would listen to one side which might be what 20 minutes maybe yeah. 25 25 if it was long then you'd you'd stop and have a cup of tea and you know you'd chat and then you'd, you'd come back and you put side two on or you might wait till the next day but i mean because you can get 74 minutes on a cd that's encouraged me to to think in terms of more like an hour of new music and we do still think you know being old school we do still think in terms of physical product rather than sure. download yeah well you know i, th I think it's you know a listening experience taking in an album you know rather than just a, a batch of unrelated singles so you know i think i'll always prefer that um, we do yeah i mean we we do think really carefully about the sequencing of the music and about the artwork that goes with it i mean a lot of thought and energy goes into that and we want it to be we want it to be a physical object because i think if it is just a you know a download it's not it's not special it's, no, it's a, it I could never... be it could be it could be hugely special music but wrapping it up in a bit of cardboard <laughs> with a beautiful picture on the front it just it's just like the way you would gift wrap a present well, for a loved yeah, one i, you I know just what I mean? feel like i never own something if i just have a file of it on a computer you know it's, yeah it's yeah a, that's right you know it's like the physical product is forever more or less who knows mm. how long mm. it, it'll be up in the cloud or whatever, you know, I'd say not forever. So it's almost nice to have the real thing. Yeah. You know, as you know, a keepsake, if you know, that's going to last for decades. So, it yeah. is, it's kind of nice. It feels, it feels solid and tangible and enduring, as you say. And um, fortunately for us, Burning Shed are the UK company that are making, making a bit of a fist of continuing physical sales where most companies are just panicking and just going over to the streaming model, uh, which I have to say, it doesn't really benefit the artist greatly. <laughs> it's, all, it's all right if you've got a catalog of 100,000 songs, you can make probably quite decent money every year, but are you gonna get a new catalog of 100,000 songs over the, year, over the ensuing 10 years if you just give it away for a fraction of a cent at a, at a time? I don't feel it's sustainable and i've spoken to one exec from a leading uh uk music company who agreed with me he said he said i think it's sustainable but our company is um a shareholder in spotify and that's the model that the corporate direction is going in. i'm not able to argue against it and it's, it's happening across the board but burning shed have stuck to the old idea you know you buy you buy a lump of something with some noise on it and it comes in the post and you're excited you think, oh there's that new album by so and so so yeah we're, we're comfortable with that that's how what's what we grew up with you know we're probably too old to rethink it now yeah myself included <laughs> right <laughs> so uh the title star clocks are you into astrology or anything like that or what inspired it um a, a lot of my song lyrics do end up being about the um you know the constellations the outer reaches of the heavens the the uh jupiter rising and uh you know the moon and the sun and it's kind of i'm not into astrology as such i'm not into the zodiac although actually there was a very good this, this I, I digress but there's a very good album that came out in the 60s called zodiac cosmic sounds that me and my um school buddies used to like a lot it was a uh, very imaginative uh, orchestrations with a voiceover telling you all about you know what's up with the various signs of the zodiac it, interesting piece of work I, mm. I don't believe in um zodiacal stuff although actually you have to take into account the fact that the members of egg were all capricorn and so was their their road manager who was an integral part of the band and a close friend anthony vinyl who used to travel around with us is also a capricorn so you think oh, maybe there's something to this being born at a certain time of year that gives you a certain personality tray or something um but yeah i don't i don't look at my horoscope um the there is a kind of cosmic thing going on in the back of my mind i'm not really writing about um relationships very much i'm not really writing about um boy meets girl you know uh the common fodder of pop music the i'm certainly not interested in describing um jacking one's body on the dance floor 
uh, that's not my ly lyrical thing. But I do occasionally feel that I want to write something for Barb, and I, I've written love songs with Barb in mind. Um, there is there is a new song on on the new album, which is um, which is like that. It's about how I feel about her, and um, you know it, that naturally comes up. But I think the imagery of it will usually be wrapped up in something a little bit more abstruse than. You know, I love the way you move, and I like the look of your, I like the look of your hindquarters in that dressing gown that we bought the other <laughs> week. You know, I, do, I don't do that. I do try to frame it in such a way that it relates to a wider world that a lot of people could relate to. You know, um, and that they could apply to anybody that they loved, and it would work for any gender or any any combination of people that loved each other. So yeah, it's more of a generality. But yeah, I can't get away from this cosmic thing, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, I'm an old hippie, what can I say? So star clocks, yeah. Um, I originally wanted to call it Skyhooks. <laughs> I'd seen that on the front of a Superman comic when I was about 10. And I had no idea what it meant, but it was a really good drawing of some hooks hanging in the sky. And I thought, yes, sky hooks, you know. And I thought hooks is good because it's got a poppy connotation. Sky ticked my um, cosmic box, but Barb hated it. She said, oh, no, I don't like that. It's too aggressive. So I said, okay, then, right, well. And then it just came up with star clocks one day, and um, there we go. It became that. But we, um, we'd found imagery that we liked. We visited Exeter Cathedral um, one time and they have a beautiful old medieval clock in there which shows the hours of the day and the movement of the sun and the moon. It's all beautifully painted in bright colours. And we found an image of a similar medieval clock which I think is in Wells in Somerset and that became the um, the album artwork, you know, the, um, the central image. Um, which went really well with the Star Clocks um, idea because it was at a time when people measured time exclusively by the stars rather than by um, their, um, their smartphone. Yeah. Well, I really like the cover art. I think it's... Uh... Yeah, it's great. And we have a very good artist called Michael Inns who works with us. And I really make poor old Mike jump through hoops when he's doing the artwork. It's like, I'm the same working in the studio with musicians i make them do it hundreds of times and i plague them and annoy them and so oh can you try it like this and oh and actually no disregard that i liked it the way i told you the first time you know three hours ago and so on and so forth and but with mike there's a process where he comes up with an idea and then we kind of tweak it and um i really respect his work and he he, he does say at the end of projects that i do and we do um challenge him in a really good way. We, we make him do stuff he wouldn't normally do. And we're both very happy with, with how it comes out. Yeah, it looks good. I yeah. Like yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your collaborative process with Barb? Yeah, it's, it's quite complicated. I kind of keep the songs a bit under wraps. I don't even tell her what they're called until I'm really ready to um, have, have her start thinking about vocals. So, I keep it under wraps in my music room and at some point and I think, all right, look, this is a song actually. It's not just me noodling on the keyboards. This is um this is gonna be a song. Yeah, let's do it. So I come up with a lyrical concept and a title and then I play it to Barb and by that time I've usually got at least a chorus tune or a verse tune that she can record and she starts off um by she takes a copy of the Logic song that I've been working on. She has Logic in her music room. She puts up the MIDI part that I do the guide vocal in, because so I record a guide part for her over MIDI. She puts that up on screen and renders it as notation so she can see the dots and sight read it, because she's a good reader. And I give her the lyrics in a kind of Word document, and she sometimes I have to make it clear that um, one of the words is stretched out over three or four notes but she soon gets it and she will record a guide without me being there and i then come in maybe later that day or the next morning or whatever and i listen to it i go yeah 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 this is great and then we usually discuss phrasing options perhaps this note could be pushed maybe it was better if that's a triplet do work on the rhythmic side of it do work on the uh maybe a note needs to come in later or this is maybe sing this more laid back we start getting into detail and 
this might only be one part of the song, you know, it's not the whole vocal. So gradually, so I can then leave her to practice that while I finish the other parts of the vocal. And um, gradually the whole thing gets pieced together bit by bit, like a car assembly line, you know, a section at a time. It didn't used to be like that. When we, in the old days, we were working to recording deadlines. We just had to do stuff much more quickly, but now we have endless time to do stuff at home. We, it tends to come over together over a period of weeks rather than days, but it is a back and forth process. And the final uh, outcome is that Barb will go into um, a big room we have in the center of our house and she'll set her mic up there in a part of the room where we know it sounds the best. And I will sit in my room and speak to her over talkback and she will record the vocal with me producing. And she does the whole song in a day or so, just stop every, every once in a while to rest her voice. We'll get the whole vocal down. We'll maybe have three or four takes of the whole thing, all sounding great. And then we'll comp it, you know, we'll say, right, okay, let's, let's pick the best bits. I don't do any tuning. I just comp it up and she is, has got very, very good tuning. But if we do find like one flat note in the thing, I'll say to look, I'm going to tune that note. Okay. So I use a program called Melodyne and that note gets dealt with in the old days. I'd make a singer 20 times till it was perfectly in tune. We don't do that anymore. We use the tools that are available, but we don't just slap it on like most people do. We, um, we use it judiciously and sparingly because if you run your whole vocal through a, a tuner, a quarter tune or melodyne, it changes the timbre of the voice slightly. And if you tune every note, it's, it's unnatural. It's mechanical. Oh, no, it's, and you hear that on pop music all the time. Um, yeah, now, and it's you know. become a, a standard sound. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's so robotic. I, I, I have a low tolerance for it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it robs it robs the vocal the vocalist of their personality if you if you overuse it. But it's a useful tool for the odd rogue note, which which every singer is going to do at some point. Sure. Um, you know, you can just deal with it and make not have to make them kill themselves <laughs> recording hundreds of takes to get it perfect. Absolutely. I have um I, as a slight digression, but I have done a number of keyboard pop sessions for um the type of bands you got on TV talent shows. I know a couple of producers that uh, produce that stuff. <clears throat> and I've I've had the opportunity of hearing some of these so-called singers with the auto-tune turned off, and it's not a pleasant experience. So basically, they're just kind of propping them up with it. They they get them right rhythmically, but that usually involves a lot of hacking about on screen to get them to do it in time. And then they put the auto-tune on, and they go through with a fine tooth comb, getting notes that are really badly out of tune into tune, and making these people sound like they can sing. But a lot of the time, really, they've been selected for their looks rather than their vocal accuracy i was going to ask because you know there's still plenty of talented singers to choose from out there why why do they feel compelled to use these less talented people it's just because of their stars in some circle and well known as personality somewhere you know it's, it depends what it depends what sector of the industry we're talking about i mean obviously there's a whole big thing of like getting you know pretty young people pretty boys pretty girls and turning them into pop stars by a kind of cynical manufacturing process you know like they'll they'll employ a, a team of songwriters you know 15 people writing a song you know she's kind of ludicrous but everybody gets to write a bit until somebody thinks it's perfect and then they use different producers and different remixes. And in the end, you've got a cast of thousands just for some daft little pop album. You do get very good sounding results. I mean, the sonics of this stuff are incredible. But when you um, get past that and you get past the image of the artist and the, the video where they look appealingly at the camera and young people of their age fall in love with them, um, you think, actually, well, look, may, you know, come on, maybe it's not a great song. Um, some artists do do really great songs um, and some of them are written by the artists themselves or some are written by songwriters and I don't mind artists doing covers um, by other people I mean um, you know back in the 60s there's a great English band called the Hollies who, who are a fab, fabulous group most sure. of their hits most of their hits were written by um, professional songwriters yeah, well, but some of them are great people. you know it's some great great songs you know yeah you remember Graham Goldman from 10cc yeah, I did a yeah. session with Graham. Yeah, um, yeah. he, he yeah. wrote a lot of those early 60s hits for the Yardbirds yeah. and the Hollies and yeah. a lot of those guys. 
Yeah, and they're great songs, you know. So, and then the band were good at delivering them. So that's that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with the artificiality of it and pretending that uh, you know something is what it isn't. You know, artifice is acceptable in pop music, but you know, lying about people's innate talents is not is not a good thing. Uh, you know, it's best to, to fess up about it. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to their credit, I mean, the artists themselves know if they're any good or not. And there was a there was a very famous singer who apparently said to one of my producer mates when she came into the studio, she, she said, you know, I'm not very good, right? I'm not very good. Just just tell me if I'm doing it right. Tell me if I'm doing it wrong. I'm not, I'm not a great singer, you know? And I think, okay, as long as you don't go around thinking you're a great singer because you've been um, turned into one by a computer, that's probably all right as well. Sure, yeah. So um, a couple more things I want to ask about. Um, you know, I think I first came to know you through your, your writings. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an old progressive rock fan from way back, but I th think I got a copy of your uh, Introducing the Dots book back in, mm -hmm. gosh, in the 80s, I think, mm -hmm. and um, really enjoyed it. You know, I really liked the fact that you – went about it from a different angle because there's so many books out there that tell you about chords and theory, but it's a really dry subject as a rule. And mm -hmm. they often don't tell you much about how to use it in context mm -hmm. and you do. And mm -hmm. what I love is you also talk about kind of the character and the flavors that you get quarterly, you know, a major mm -hmm. seventh chord versus mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. dominant nine. Yeah. You know, and I was just kind of curious what led you to write the book in the first place and um, what, how you decided to kind of go at it at this angle. Yeah, I, I, I have enjoyed passing on what I, um, what I think about music to other people, and they do seem to have appreciated it, which I'm grateful for. Um, it all started in around about 1977, 78. Um, I had a friend uh, who's a journalist, a guy called Tony Bacon, used to write for a magazine called Sound International, it's a UK publication. And I think Tony had probably interviewed me when I was in, you know, National Health or something. And, we, he, and he was a, you know, funny guy. We got on well with, with him. He liked to laugh. And one day we were chatting and he said, would you like to write a column about music for the magazine? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, okay. He said, you know, about kind of reading and writing music, you know, um, for the benefit of, of people that, um, you know, can't do it. And I said, yeah, sure. And I had pretty strong idea that it, the way it was being done, as you say, it was being done, that kind of thing was done in a very, it was either very, very classical, or you got sucked into the, the kind of jazz vortex, you know. So the next thing we do to a major triad is put a flat seventh on top of it, a dominant seventh chord. You know, I don't like that chord. I think it's sort of, it's just not very nice. And um, Alan Holdsworth, incidentally, once told me that the, the usual voicing of a major seventh chord where you go root, major third, fifth, major seventh, he thought that sounded absolutely appalling. <laughs> <laughs> but he could, he could take the same four notes and play it to you on the guitar in different permutations, which sounded absolutely beautiful. So that was no problem. It wasn't the chord himself itself he objected to it was the voicing so i started writing about you know how, how you write music down and after a bit i sort of veered off into you know how you write rhythm down and then the bit i was you know most enthusiastic about was like chords and intervals and what you what you call them and how they work and in the second book i wrote because the, it, the, this eventually all turned into a book i mean it came out in the magazine and then um I th as i recall the publisher of the magazine said, oh, this could make a great book, let's compile it into a book. And that was introducing the dots. Um, and that sold really well. Um, and so I did a, a follow-up book. And in that, I really did go quite deeply into chord voicing. And have pointed out in both books that there is a standard jazz way of going about this, but that's not my thing. I, I prefer to think of it as a more... Um, logical exercise where you can add intervals to a chord but you can leave out other notes and why it might be good to do so and some cool voicings you know like where you put the third in the bass and you add a an added second to the chord i mean that's a chord we use a lot in uh stuart gaskin you play like you play like c major you know c e g 
and you move the E, take the E out of the middle there, put it down in the base, but then put a D in above the C. So you've now got right hand C, D, G, and in the base E. That's a lovely chord, and that we call that um, C, C add two over E, or people call those kind of chords a slash chord. So this is the kind of stuff we've been doing with Baron. Baron can now play the alarmingly sophisticated chords through working with us, and. Um, the books were trying to come, not necessarily saying you need to push this stuff out quite so far, but if you want to, this is this is a way of looking at it that's not the standard jazz or um, you know outdated classical way of thinking about it. Yeah, well, I, I just I, I like to think of it that way. You know, I like to think of it almost like you know you're a painter and you have a box of colors that you can work with. You know, yeah, yeah. different personalities. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the the vibe and the personality of some different types of chords that people commonly use. Yeah, well, th that chord I just described, the kind of added second chord. If you don't play, if you don't play the bass note and you just play those three notes, C, D, and G. So you've got um, at the bottom of that those three notes, you've got C and D, which is the tone interval, which some people think is a discord. You know, I, I don't happen to agree. I think that's perfectly fine to have a tone interval in the chord. And then you've got the fifth of the G, which is very strong relationships to the C. So you've got a very positive sounding chord there with the C and the G really resonates. But the D is harmonically ambiguous. It's neither minor nor major. Harmony is essentially a cultural agreement that some ways of combining notes is a happy mood and some ways of uh, um, other ways of doing it is a sad mood. So if you have a minor third in a triad, C, E flat and G, that's minor. We've all got to cry, right? Sure. But if you want a triumphal happy mood, you know, the end of the end of a symphony, we're all happy now because all the problems have been sorted out, goes into the major key and you end up going C, G, C, G, C, G. So, right. For, you know, for like 10 minutes, you know, say, so, yeah, yeah, everything's great in the world, you know, because you're hammering out major chords, right? So um, we do, we're brought up with that. That's our cultural um, indoctrination. We, we think, oh, yes, happy music has happy chords, majors. Sad music, oh, they've all gone mine and oh dear, you know, it's miserable. And it's reinforced over and over again in film music, in pop music. If we grew up in Bali, we wouldn't have any of that indoctrination. We have a whole other thing going on, which I won't go into, but equally beautiful and valuable, and but culturally agreed, you know. So harmony is a cultural construct. And Bach made it possible by tuning all the intervals in the octave equally, thing they call equal temperament, to move freely between 12 keys in any way you like, which is brilliant. Um, so if you play something in the key of C, you can play it again in the key of E, which would be what you call a modulation from C to E. And that has an effect, you know, going up to E from C is uplifting. Whereas if you went down to A flat from C, it's a descent that feels, oh, that's a little bit depressing. Often working with, um, naive musicians and i don't mean that unkindly i mean musicians who are you know just got a very simple grasp of how harmony works they'll say oh no i don't like it when you played that tune because it's like you went down there and that's a bit of a downer man you know so if you go up the, the smile returns to their face so um you have to figure out how to utilize that yourself um, based on your own reaction to what you're hearing but the thing i like to do is to not have equal intervals all the way through the chord so that chord alan holsworth hated c e g and b is like four donuts piled on top of each other when you look right. at it written down right so what alan would do is he'd probably put the b sort of two octaves up <laughs> and sprain his little finger playing it you know you spread out and in your chords you have a mixture of quite big intervals like maybe um a minor sixth but you could have a semitone in there as well so you're mixing it up and you're getting something that's not not the run-of-the-mill thing and maybe it is neither happy nor sad and maybe you imply that by the progression of chords and this way it starts getting really interesting because you can write chord sequences which are like the words in the sentence they flow on naturally so we can treat them as a kind of language a kind of um, moving from a to b over time through a certain state to another state with a certain kind of meaning. Meaning in music is the same thing as feeling. Uh, it's not literal meaning. 
it's not supposed to produce literal images in the mind, not the way I see it, but it does produce subtle shades of emotion. And that emotion can change as the music develops. So you're developing something that's a bit like film. It's, it's a bit like literature. You're, you know, it's kind of linear from left to right. It develops, you read from left to right, a sequencing thing. And the brain follows it and is really pleased to follow. And if, if the music has a logic to it, it will be pleasing to the brain because we're looking for symmetry and meaning and harmony. But it doesn't always have to be the same thing. And you can have unexpected um, veering off. Like the classic thing is to change key. Um, the classic, classic thing is to hammer out a chorus of a pop song and then go up a semitone. <laughs> That's right. what we call it's what we call the Eurovision chord change. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. I think it's a bit obvious. So I think in America we call it the truck driver <laughs> modulation because you just jam it into the next gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Um, so you, yeah, you go. You know, you go up a semitone. So that's really corny. Um, so sometimes I do want to go up a semitone, and the way I achieve it usually is by you know four bars before the 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 um the truckers change up, I go down. Uh, so I'll go down a minor third, um, and then hang about there for a bit, and then leap up a fourth, which gets me to a semitone uh, above the the key we were working in. But it sounds like it's a real big jump. It's exciting, and it's not corny. That's so that's that, that's my thing. You know, it's, it's one of the little tricks I try to do. Well, I do yeah. think harmonically, it, harmonic thinking is um, a big part of what I do. Well, you know, I think that some modulations just are so predictable, but other ones, you know, things like when you, anything where you move a third away, a minor third, a major third, that always seems to kind of break the cliches that you get around the obvious. Yeah. Semitone I think, um, or a fourth away or a fifth away, which seems yeah. rather bland. I think, um, I think it's always um, fruitful to maybe leave out the third of a chord and to keep it ambiguous. And it gives you know if if you're working in a in a session environment sometimes what happens is you go and you play keyboards and then a guitarist follows you in the next day right and so you don't get any chance to coordinate what you're going to do um on the times when i've gone into the studio following the guitarist's work the day before i've often been disappointed there isn't any room to move if the guitarist has played full you know full bar chords on the guitar with all the strings ringing all the time I'm not going to be able to bend it around, but if I go in first, I'm going to leave spaces in in the harmony that the guitarist could um, could exploit, and he could decide on his own chord voicings. I can leave the thing with a more ambiguous fill and feel, I should say. And um, I, I think it's doing the track more service to do that. Otherwise, you end up with everybody playing the same big full chords, and it's just stock stuff. Boring, yeah. yeah. It seems, I don't know, just sort of dense and in one place rather than kind of spreading it out. Yeah. There is one, there is one classic chord that I'd recommend to keyboard players and not generally playable on the guitar because the, um, the, the range of it is too great. But it's a two-handed chord. And what you do with, with your left hand, you play a sort of a, a bass note, um, not too low, um, maybe an octave below middle C, and then you play a fifth above that, and then you play another fifth above that. So you basically got C, G, D. So you've got two superimposed fifths, right? Then with the right hand, you do the same thing, but you start a semitone above the note you got to um, with your left hand. So you go, uh, you ended up on D in the left hand, so you go E flat, you go up a fifth to B flat, and up another fifth to, to F. And now your chord is spanning, um, it's spanning over two octaves, which is why it's impossible on the guitar. But it's an incredible minor 11th chord, that, that voicing. Um, highly recommended to composers. If you take your right hand and move it up a semitone, it becomes an incredible major, uh, major seven augmented 11th chord, which has a similarly great effect. It's got the ninth in there. It's got the major seventh in there. It's got a kind of sharp eleventh interval in it. It just sounds really cool. Or you, what you could have done is you could have gone back to the E flat starting point for your right hand and drop your left hand down a semitone, which would um, give you that major thing again. You've got a tone gap between the two thumbs on the keyboard, sure. but you've got your major 
7th, 9th, uh, augmented 11th. Again, these are great chords. I, I've used them a lot in the past. I sometimes think, if I'm writing with those chords, it's cheating because it's so easy to make it sound great. Um, you know, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this, this, is, I sh this should be harder. But it's, it's a really nice, if you're into harmony, um, you can hear um, slightly abstruse chords of that nature. You, you'll have a good time with them on the keyboard. Excellent, excellent tip. Thank you for sharing that. No, that's all. Do you feel like your approach to harmony has evolved and changed over the years? Um, I would say that, generally speaking, uh, listening back to my old old compositions and old um, playing in bands, that I tend to use rather fewer notes in chords um, because the sounds I'm I'm using now are so big. You don't need so many notes. I mean, that sounds silly, but it's true. You, if you're playing a prophet five, um, and you've got these two oscillators beating against each other, sort of deliberately slightly arching with a chorusing effect, swirling around there in stereo. It's a big sound. You could play a three note chord. That'll do you, man. You don't need to play like a jazz chord with all the notes in. In fact, that sounds stupid. Um, Thomas Dolby tells the story of producing Joni Mitchell where he constructed a huge sonic event for her to play with one finger. And it was like, okay, I've layered all these sounds. I've got a vocal in there. I've got a piano in there. I've got a bass. I've got, you know, all these things going on, sort of finger symbol. Joni, just play like one note. And you, this is a really cool sound. Joni went over to the keyboard and played a jazz chord. <laughs> like, you know, so <laughs> dominant seventh chord. And she said, oh, man, that sounds terrible. And he said, yeah, but that's not the idea. You just play with one finger. And apparently she, she didn't see the point, you know. Um, you, you've got to be tuned into what sound you're making. Don't just play any old keyboard any old way. If, you, if you're playing a Hammond organ, you can play certain chords. If you're arranging for strings, you, again, you want fewer notes because the sound of a mass string section is very big and lush. And it's better to leave notes out. Like, you know, working with Stephen Wilson, I, when I started doing it, I probably put too many notes into the arrangements. And there was one piece where he said, look, can you, you know, you're overdoing it a bit. Can you, can you back off a bit? And I, I knew what he meant. I was trying to cram too much in. I'd thin it out because I knew the guys that we, we hired for the, uh, playing the sessions would make a beautiful, rich sound with simpler chords. And so, I, I, you know, I wasn't ashamed to do that. I think it was the right thing for the music, and I would do it any every time now. So I think, yeah, I've become less dense. Um, I, I would like to work more with space, with more transparent sounds, and perhaps, um, generally speaking, with less dense arrangements. Like, you know, New Jerusalem was like really going for the jugular with piling on the overdubs, and so was busy doing nothing in its way. I would be less inclined to do that now. I'd be more inclined to leave like nice big open space. I like to improvise, so I would leave space for myself to improvise, for Baron to improvise, and for Barbara to have more space to work out vocal stuff, uh, some of which she has come up with through improvisation. You know, she's just come up with a great line occasionally for a song that I'd never have thought of. So, yeah, it's a tendency to just, just cool it a bit. You know, I think it was a bit like over egged, if you pardon the expression, with some of my early work. Less is more. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. But if you, if you follow that extension through, you should just retire, but, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not too much up to, yeah. up to a certain point. Less is more. Yeah. <laughs> what do you listen to for pleasure just around the house? Well, it's a strange mixture. Um, I keep coming back to sixties classics. I, I, I have to, every so often I have to hear you really got me by the kinks. You know, I just have to put that. It just reminds me where I came from. It's just the quintessential sound of exciting guitar rock that out of which grew a whole genre of distorted guitar and, you know, mega metal bands and Meshuggah. I've listened <laughs> to Meshuggah. You know the band Meshuggah? Yeah, yeah, I do. They're yeah, brilliant. kind of like in insane black metal, you know. Those guys I know how to count. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they certainly can count, yeah. Um, but the sound, it's just like, crushingly great you know um the gent sound i love um they're playing some mad stuff i've, I've listened to that uh, gavin turned me on to some of that stuff um their guitarist frederick um did a solo album that gav gave me a copy of and that was that had some really good stuff on so um but i will gravitate back and you, you know i would always want to be able to kind of have access to um good vibrations and 
Strawberry Fields Forever and the stuff that turned me on when I was really young that seemed to me to sum up the the, the, the beauty of pop music, not just the the trite emotions of Boy Meets Girl, but something much deeper and, and far-reaching. What were some of the groups you saw live when you were a teen? Yeah, good question. Um, okay, I saw Jimi Hendrix live wow. in 67. There's a film clip, man, that, that showed up. It was a gig, I think it was at Earl's Court, or it might have been at Olympia. It was, it was a London kind of big exhibition hall. I went there with Mont Campbell, who was my school buddy that um, I played in Egg with. Sure. And we went up the front to Hendrix. It was, it was fucking incredible. It's like, wow, Jesus. Uh, I saw him again in London in the concert hall, which is a bit easier to hear what he was doing because it wasn't quite so loud. Um, but um, he just like blew all of our minds. We couldn't believe this guy. Where, like, where did he come from? You know, because we'd had what we thought were great guitarists, but after after hearing him, we thought, well, we should probably rethink that a bit. You know, <laughs> um, I saw the Pink Floyd um, with Sid at the um, Queen Elizabeth Hall. Hey, where National Health once played. Um, they were great. I really like Rick Wright's keyboard playing. Um, that Farfisa sound and his meandering improvisations and some of their music is fantastic i, I really loved um scarecrow i don't know if you know that from piper yeah, at the gate yeah a real early one yeah yeah and, and all their improvisational stuff with the light shows like you know interstellar overdrive and stuff like that that's that was great you know it's a real turn on um so we saw the floyd once um so I used to go and see the nice regularly every Tuesday Tuesday night after school. We'd go around there, um, sometimes in their school uniforms, <laughs> embarrassingly, to get in to see the nice. Love Keith Emerson. Would sit right within a few. I'd sit at the front row in the marquee. I'd get first in the queue, queue up for two hours to see the nice. See Keith sticking his knives in his salmon and going bonkers and thinking, "Fucking hell, what is that guy playing?" Jesus, um, that changed my whole view of keyboard playing. Needless I can to say. Imagine. You know, Keith at close quarters. God, what a player. Um, when we got a bit older, we started playing at the Middle Earth Club and we were supporting the headlining bands there, one of whom was um, Captain Beefheart's Magic Band. Of, oh, of wow. Yeah, in the original band before Trout Mask, it was the band with, um, he had two of his older players in the band. He had um, Jerry and Alex were in the band. Dan on lead lead chaos, Drumbo on the drums, and you had Jeff Cotton in there who became part of the Trout Mask um, Nightmare. And we supported them, and the roadie came up and said, hey, man, uh, one of our mics is broken. Can we borrow your mic, man? We, said, and we were like trembling with anticipation at lending them our microphone. And when huh. we got it back afterwards, we didn't we didn't wash it for a month, you know. It was right. <laughs> Captain Beefheart's microphone, went, fucking hell, you know. Um, so a bands like Love Sculpture, who were who were great, another great band with Dave, what's his name? Dave Simons, is it Dave something on lead guitar? Sadly I've forgotten his name, but um we saw Fleetwood Mac at the marquee when they were a blues band. We saw Bloodwind Pig. Um, which was some connection with Jethro Tull, was it? Yeah, not? I think it was the first guitarist, Mick Abrams' band. Oh, Mick, yeah. Jethro there Tull. There you go. We saw yeah. them. We saw Free, the band, the blues rock yeah, band. Paul Rogers, yeah. Paul Rogers, Fantastic. Paul Kossoff. Steve Hillage was there with us when, when they played. And they were really good. And you could tell he, uh, Kossoff was a really good guitar player, but we couldn't hear him. Um, he was being drowned out by the rest of the band. And, Steve shouted out to him. He said, hey, man, turn up your amp. We can't hear you. And he said, I can't. It's turned up full. He said, it's your shit amp that we hired, <laughs> oh. <laughs> which, which put, yeah, immediately put us off um, hiring equipment. Uh, I met Keith Ralph of the Yardbirds. We supported Renaissance when Keith was in the band. Nice. Yeah, wow, very, really early. Yeah, yeah, really early. Um, I had a very nice chat with him. He's a nice fellow. And I was uh, fascinated by the clip of, the band in the film blow up i don't know if you know that clip yeah yeah the one with page and plant yeah the you've got the car you, tandem line yeah, it's not lasted it's, about a week it's not plan um it got key or no i mean sorry beck and page back and that's yeah, it yeah, so jeff that. smash smashing his guitar up you know yeah and um keith ralph told me that what had happened was that um the director um had realized that there was this thing going on where english musicians smashed up their gear he's thinking of pete townsend you know 
Sure. And he said to Jeff Wright, okay, I want you to smash up your guitar, man, for this scene. Like, go mad. You're really angry. Smash up the guitar. And Jeff said, oh, man, this is a Les Paul. I'm not smashing up my Les Paul. And the director said, right, go out and buy Jeff a cheap guitar he can smash up. So they went down the Charing Cross Road and came back with eight cheap guitars, right? <laughs> Which Jeff, because he had to, every time they did a take, he had to smash a new guitar. And uh, so that, <laughs> so the guitar he's smashing there is not his treasured Les Paul. But I enjoyed seeing that on film. I like that whole smashing up equipment thing. That appealed to my violent instincts. Did you uh, catch The Who at all? No, never saw The Who live, sadly. I'd, I'd love to have seen them live, but I never. it never happened. I think maybe they were a bit too big by the time I got to concert-going age. And the sort of gigs I liked were smaller gigs where you could see the whites of their eyes. Sure. I think, oh, no, I saw Cream at the, what's it called? Is it the Savile Theatre in Charing Cross Road? Oh, my God. They, um, we all filed in. We were schoolboys, you know, sat there. Um, curtains were drawn suddenly there was a tremendous chord a huge great major chord uh, where everybody like ginger and jack and eric just hit this power chord man the loudest thing we'd ever heard pinned us all to the to our seats it's like jesus and then they started ta playing tales of Bra brave ulysses right which is oh, one yeah. of my favorite it's like oh god and you, you know you thought this is so great i mean it it was like a door opening um a new universe that we we happily marched into and those older guys than us they were all you know three four years older than us they opened the door for us to come in later and it was a tremendous creative era oh yeah amazing and it's i think it's stood the test of time you know yeah yeah um yeah. were you into any of the 70s fusion mahavishnu and yeah forever, that kind of stuff yeah big time um so uh, you know as my playing uh, I was forced to become a jazz musician by Hatfield in the North. And that was a very instructive and educational process. I mean, I make fun of it, but it was actually very valuable because Phil Miller's harmony was um, very worthy of study. Um, so they were listening to that stuff. Uh, Alan Gowan, my, my keyboard playing pal, was played me a lot of jazz albums. I got into Weather Report. Um, I really loved, um, in a silent way, um, Miles' album. Oh, yeah. Such a love beautiful that. record. Yeah. Love. And then I heard Joe Zawinul's version of In the Silent Wave. She's actually got chord changes in, unlike Miles. He just stripped them all out. And uh, Barbara and I did a version of In a Silent Way in Tokyo one time. Um, oh, wow. What I loved about it was like, I said to Barbara, look, okay, here's, here's a tune. I say, just sing it in your own time. Yeah. Don't, you know. And then when, you, when you're going to move on to the next phrase, we'll just look at each other. Or maybe I'll cue you in if I do a bit of noodling. So, I saw Weather Report two or three times, I think, and each time they would play in a silent way with just Wayne Shorter and Joe Zawinul. And you, just this beautiful music would spill off the stage and you think, hey, wait a minute, this is in a silent way. <laughs> After about three minutes, you know, because you'd hear those phrases that are distinctive for that, but they just sort of play it and not play it and half play it and allude to it and go away from it and come back to it. I love that freedom. Uh, it's, it's improvisation just open no pulse no rhythm no click track no drums just like beautiful flowing music so we did that and it worked very nicely i think we might revive that at some point actually because it's i think it'd be really good for baron to learn that tune yeah that's just an amazing piece of music oh yeah in any context you know absolutely yeah even if you leave out the chord changes it's a fantastic yeah I, I imagine miles wanted it stripped down no, but. Yeah, he, he he was a bit of a minimalist, wasn't he? Miles. Oh yeah, so at least. he was like he said that famous thing. They said, um, "What's your advice to a soloist, Miles?" And he said, "Think of a note and don't play it." <laughs> <laughs> Good advice, actually. Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dave, I don't want to keep you much longer, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed our, our chat today. And I was wondering if there's anything you might like to share with our listeners before we wrap it up. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to say, I mean, you know, I, I guess some of your listeners come over from Progressive Ears uh, website. Yeah, and you know, you know, I, I it, founded that back in the late 90s, kind of yeah. just on a lark, and it kind of yeah. grew into something really, really big. Yeah. It's still around all these yeah, years later. Yeah. And I have to admit, yeah, my yeah, uh, yeah. love of prog rock kind of has waned over the years because 
you know, it seems like we kind of fixate on about a hundred records and mm. talk about them over and over. And after about 10 years, I felt like we kind of said all we could say. Mm. So I kind of stepped aside and it continues to this day, but, um, mm. yeah, I will definitely be sharing it there and, uh, well, good. my other social networking areas yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to say to the people who contribute to that site uh, that we've had Bar Barbara and I have had a lot of very nice comments from those people, and like it's acknowledged that it's it's nothing really much to do with my old bands. And there, when we when we sort of set forth on our forty two year journey in nineteen eighty, um, there were some people who who were kind of like, oh, it's not, oh, you know, I don't like this new stuff. Listen it's quite all right not to like our stuff. Nobody has to like our stuff. We put it out there with love in our hearts. We, we love what we do and we know other people like it. And we know a lot of those, of those listeners like it. And I would just say, um, you know, I was in those, those bands that uh, are talked about in uh, prog, prog forums for like a total of 12 years. And I am really, really proud of that music and, and all the musicians that, I played with were great players and great guys who are my lifelong friends. So I won't, I won't hear a word said against it. I'm so pleased I did it. I learned a hell of a lot in those 12 years and I'm now trying to apply it to what we do now with Stuart Gaskin. But you know, having been with Barb for 42 years, that early stuff is receding into the mists of memory and some of it is falling off the edge. It's not something I, um, I spend any time thinking about. So, um, you know, I'm now firmly in a creative world, uh, which is ongoing. We are producing new music regularly, although fairly slowly. I would invite all the um, forum users to like, you know, give us a listen. Uh, if they want to come to our gig in London, if they're able to come, it's on July the 9th, 2022, at King's Place Hall 1, London. We'd love to see them there. Um, any kind of appreciation of our music, wherever it's coming from, uh, we appreciate it. We need our listeners. We can't sort of do what we do without our listeners. So thank you for your, all your support. It's great. If you want the new prog, I can make a suggestion, which I think for me has a lot more interest than uncovering obscure Italian bands of the, the early 70s. And that will be a young, English cat called Jacob Collier. Uh, you've probably heard of Sean, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. He is the man. Okay. If you, if you want progressive rock as it was served up in 1968, 69 by the leading bands of the time who were doing great innovative work, Jacob is doing it. That is doing that very thing. Now he's serving up innovative work, which turns everything on its head and it's got amazing musical invention built into it. But critically, it might be a bit hard for people to get into because it's incredibly advanced. It's like this guy was amazing. Um, Herbie Hancock and um, um, what's that producer guy's name? Um, Quincy, Quincy. Jones. Quincy and, and Herbie were sitting and listening to Jacob's chords and going, man, what is that chord you're playing? You know, and he deals in micro harmony. He deals in micro rhythms. We splits up the beat using his computer in insane ways, but he can also play it. He's a great keyboard player, a beautiful singer, writes amazing music. I really wish that some of the the neo prog fans out there, if they're looking for the real prog experience, as, as I would identify it, would listen to Jacob and make an investment because, you know, I, I'm afraid that because his music is advanced, some people will not get it. Um, you know, um, this does happen. Is really worth sticking with. Buy his albums, go and see him at gigs, and uh, that is the progressive music of the future. You know, and all power to him. And um, he's English. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I echo that. I mean, I was totally blown away when I saw him on YouTube about five years ago. Yeah. And he can harmonize twenty ways to Sunday. You know, in, in yeah, and just in a way that no one I think really has up to this point. You know, mm. so mm. yeah, you know, he's progressive with the big p you know yeah, as in yeah. really pushing the envelope and moving forward yeah no folks it's not going to sound like 70s prog but that's not the point you know the point is to cover new ground and push the envelope and he definitely is he's his music is new um he's a young guy 
and he does things in a new way with new sounds and computers and samples and all that stuff. He's not, you know, he's got some, lots of acoustic instruments actually. He plays, he's got a big collection of stringed instruments like lutes, mandolins, etc. and he plays them all brilliantly. Um, but it is new, and if you're not a musician, it's a bit hard to get your head around some of it. It's like, whoa, what's he doing? You know, a bit like what I said earlier about Alan Holdsworth. It, it, it whips by, he has an incredibly quick musical mind, and non-musicians can't keep up, including, and sometimes I can't keep up either. Um, but you've got to give it time. You've got to give yourself time to learn how to appreciate that music. But yeah, definitely, definitely a major talent. And it's, it's nice to know that young people are doing that stuff. And that stuff is is always out there if you if you know where to find it. Absolutely, you know. I mean, there's more talent out there than people realize, and just because modern pop music isn't about that at the moment, you know, um, it doesn't mean there isn't amazing music being made all the time. So yeah, you know, it's yeah. Just a matter of finding it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today, and. Um, when the new record's out, I'd love to chat about it in the future. Yeah, sure thing. And Thanks, um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for um, stimulating my imagination. Yeah, so before you go, tell me what's Barb been up to today? Barb has been sitting patiently um, behind a computer editing a promo video <laughs> okay. that we want to share with our um, with our listeners in, in the next week or so. We made um, a little kind of, it's, it's like an occasional series we thought we would do where we recorded us chatting about our music uh starts off with me and barb recalling our early tracks that we did which um, we enjoyed re revisiting because they were done like 40 years ago so they sound quite fresh to us now um we then uh, zoomed up to baron who was sitting uh, a few miles away in his studio and um got his uh viewpoint on how it was coming into our music camp in later years, because um, he'd never heard of us actually when I originally called him up, and we, yeah, we, we got his input, and in fact we spoke for about uh, nearly two hours. So, if we manage to get around to doing some more episodes, you'll, you'll be hearing more from Baron. So Bob's doing that, and it, it's um, we're not neither of us very, have very good video editing chops, but we're um, we're working it out between us, you know. So that's um, that's something. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a. A kind of sidestep but we we do need to do our own promotion for our upcoming concert and this would help with that excellent well give her my best and we'll i will keep an eye yeah. out for that and, and share it on social media when uh when it arrives so okay thank you well, Sean. Dave, take care it's been a real pleasure and uh let's talk again sometime yes indeed all righty then take care mm -hmm.